Hello, my name is Pat Allen, and I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. And the program in Cincinnati, Ohio, is, is directed by Brian Powers. And I'm here in Canfield, Ohio, on August the 21st, to take the interview of a Vietnam veteran a. Robert Steiskel. Mr. Steiskel, thank you for giving me this interview. You're very uh, welcome. Uh, you go by Bob? Yeah, I go by Bob. Uh, I, I knew that because you and I were classmates in law school that 55 years ago. <coughs> uh, first it only of all, seems like yesterday, but yeah, exactly. <coughs> we, we are at the uh, county courthouse in the, in the jury room in Canfield, Ohio. Uh, which is near Bob's residence. What is your home address, Bob? 6021 <coughs> Chittister Drive, Canfield, Ohio. And are you married? Yes, I am. And to whom are you married? Mary Rose Tyskel. How long have you and Mary Rose been married? Uh, 37, no, 38 years. It's a good thing she's not here listening. Yeah, no, <laughs> she is not. <laughs> uh, do you have children? I have three children. What are their names and ages? A. Robert. He is 50 at this point since I'm 80 because he was born on my birthday in 1970. Then there's Jeffrey Michael. He was born in uh, April of 1973. I'm sorry, March of 73. And then Erica, <coughs> our daughter, my daughter with Mary Rose, was born in 84, uh, April 14th, 1984. And is, uh, are, you, are your boys married? Yes, they are all married. Everybody's married. Uh, what are their wives' names? Uh, Jeffrey's is uh, Jeffrey's. Oh, Je uh, Rob is divorced. All right. Uh, his wife uh, was. Uh, I forget. Anyway, the uh, Jeffrey is married to. Uh, oh boy, I've suddenly drawn a blank. Anyway, Eric is married to Chris Adolph out in Washington State. Jeff is, <clears throat> has two kids. They are Gavin and uh, Madeline, and Rob has two children, Lindsay and uh, his name is Justin. Justin and Madeline? Justin, uh, Justin and Lindsay. Is, Lindsay is and Lindsay, Rob. okay. <clears throat> uh, and how about Erica, does she have children? No, she doesn't. All right. She's currently working for a department, uh, a place that uh, produces artwork out in uh, Seattle, Washington. Good. Uh, she's, I've seen Her some husband is a professor at the University of Washington in economics and politics. Well, I've seen some of her artwork at your home, and uh, she's quite an accomplished artist. So uh, how about your parents? What are your parents' names? My, my dad was uh, passed away in 1988. He was a teacher. He was the person who owned the property on which this building is sitting. But, uh, and uh, my mom died in December of 1993. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I have one brother who's deceased. He passed away in 2015 in uh, February. What was his name? Richard Norman. And uh, did he have children? He had two kids. Uh, well, he actually had more than that because he had been divorced. He had Sherry and Vicky by his first wife, and then he had uh, he had uh, Richard, Ricky, and uh, Katie by his second wife. Good. Um, what, what he was also a veteran. He was he served uh, in uh, Thailand as a uh, in the army uh, during the Vietnamese War. Yes. And uh, what, what did your dad do as far as uh, occupation? He was a teacher. He taught industrial arts and he was an entrepreneur. Where, where did he teach? He taught at Austin Town Fitch High School. My mom was also a teacher at Austin Town Fitch as well. And you say he was also an entrepreneur. Yes. What, was he a property he, owner or what? Well, he... he he was not a person who liked to sit, and he used to, uh, when I was growing up, he would have us work on his various projects, which included commercial buildings and so forth. 
to the point where when I was 16, I told I had friends who were getting jobs for a dollar an hour and I was getting 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him I could hardly wait to get a job and he laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, where'd you go to uh, grade school? Well, that's Boston Town Fetch. The, our family moved. My dad's family is from up around uh, Westlake, Ohio. And he and my mom met at Kent State. <clears throat> and after that, he taught at Cleveland East Tech for a little while. And then he came down here and taught at Letonia, Ohio. And then we moved to the corner of Raccoon and Mahoning in Austintown, Ohio. All right, and so you went to grade school in Austin Town? Yes, I did. And how about high school? Same thing. When did you graduate high school? 1958. So then where did you go after high school? I was at Ohio State for about two quarters, and then I just was not happy down there, so I left down there, and I finished up at YSU. What's YSU? State. Okay. Uh, obviously, that's in Youngstown, Ohio. Yes. And uh, what, what did you do after, when did you graduate from Youngstown State? 1962, and then I, I went to Ohio Northern University for law school, and where I escaped from there in 1965. And Ohio Northern University is where I went to uh, law school. You and I were classmates. So That's correct. What little town was that in? Ada, Ohio. That's a little bit east of uh, Lima? About 30 miles, about 20 miles east of Lima on the Pennsylvania railroad tracks. Right. So after, after law school, uh, what, what did you do? Well, the first thing I did, I was working at a law firm <clears throat> doing the gopher work. Where? At, uh, in Youngstown at the law offices of Stevens, Steven, well, at that point it was Wilkes, Stevens and Wilkes, because Oscar had retired. Oscar Stevens was a fine gentleman who was an attorney. And it was, there was a fellow, Jerry Stevens, so it was Stevens, Stevens, and Wilkes initially. And then it became Stevens and Wilkes, and then it became Wilkes. So I was working for all three at various times. All right, and uh, so what, what did you do after you was, were working well, for I, those I firms? did not pass the bar exam the first time. <clears throat> so I was stuck, I went to work for the uh, probate court with Judge Henderson for a period of time. In what court? And then I received my draft notice. He was probate judge. What, in what court? Probate court. In where? Pardon me? What county? In Mahoning County. Right. And what town was, was that Youngstown, in? Ohio. All right. So you got drafted then? I got drafted and went into, <laughs> so I jumped into the Air Force. <clears throat> well, where did you, uh, where did you go uh, for enlistment? I went to Cleveland, Ohio, where I was, uh, I was told I would be a part of the, I would go through the basic training in 66, and thereafter I would be uh, part of the officer training class of late 1966, which is just about what happened. All right. Well, take, take us through your, uh, your military training. Well, the initial military <coughs> training was just basic training. After that, and which was like nine weeks, ten weeks, uh, you know, you go through the uh, issues of KP, you go through the issues of security as a security detail, you go through issues of uh, running miles, you shoot weapons, you do, this is just basic, basic military uh, conduct. And that was for about how long? But, about nine, ten weeks. All right. Then what, what was your In career? July or August, I think it was, I went through, started with the <clears throat> Officers Candidate School when, and I, when I finished, I finished that in October or November, I think November. And then I was uh, assigned to OSI. I had thought that I would pass the, take the bar exam again, and I didn't take it at that point because I was in the middle of uh, military training. What was OSI? Office of Special Investigations. Right. And did you OSI, that? Office of Special Investigations, is, a, is the Air Force's version of uh, intelligence operations and uh, you do 
basic interviews of people for security clearances. You also conduct criminal investigations. Uh, so it's a, that's sort of the general, sort of like a police department above, uh, an investigative department above the basic MPs and that type of thing. Right. And where did you do that? I, well, I completed my training in uh, January, December of 66, and then I was assigned to Oxnard Air Force Base in California. Well, where did you do that basic OSI training? In Washington, D. at Tempo. <clears throat> if you go to Washington, D.C. now, the uh, Air and Space Museum on the Ellipse is uh, where the temporary E building was. It was a building constructed during World War II and it was the headquarters of the Office of Special Investigations as well as the uh, MPs for the Air Force and other security type. I, I believe there was a there was a separate unit in, in that area where who was conducting some uh, top secret stuff that was in the in that part of that building but we never we were never permitted to get into that area. There was, that was a secure area and we weren't allowed. So after that you went to Oxnard? Oxnard Air Force Base. Where was that? Oxnard Air Force Base is about 10 miles from Ventura, California, northwest of Los Angeles, about 80 miles. And what were your duties there? Pardon? What were your duties there? I would do background <coughs> investigations and uh, and security investigations of various individuals. Well, basically, uh, the background investigation is they would give you a, a sheet of paper with a name, and you'd go talk, make arrangements to talk to the person, and you would discuss the name of the person that you were supposed to be investigating. So let's say I was supposed to figure out if you would deserve the security clearance. I wouldn't interview you, I would interview a person who knows you. And so they would give me a sheaf of papers and I would go into the San Fernando Valley. And when I say the San Fernando Valley, at that time San Fernando Valley was a, a an extremely active uh, military contracting outfit. We had dozens and dozens of various uh, contractors for the military, Hughes, North American, uh, Lockheed, uh, Grumman, they were all there. And some, and very, some lower, in lower amount, lower individual companies that were involved with the, uh, with the military, with the main company. Uh, they at various times I would walk into an office and I would see somebody I, because I had initially wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and so I would walk into an office where there were a hundred of these people who had become engineers and the guy in the front was designing a screw to go into a metal object that was supposed to go into the into some something that was going on an airplane and there were just, and he did his little bit, and the guy behind him did his little bit, and they went all the way to the back of the room like that, and then it went around to the side of the room where this guy over on the left or the guy on the right developed, reviewed what everybody had done in those. <laughs> it, was just, it, was just, it was just an amazing thing, and I, want, and I would have access to their pay and everything else as a result of that. So when I did that, one day I sat down at, when I left and I counted up everybody who was in there and what they were making and in 1967 they were making something, that room was getting paid something like a million dollars a month, which just absolutely blew my mind. I, I just was like, how could, where, how are we getting anything done? You know, because they, they, they were all, everybody was doing this little bit. And I came to think, I don't know if this is true, but I came to think that this was just a division of labor to avoid responsibility for what they were doing. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's true, but it was that was my attitude. But I went all through the San Fernando Valley, San Fernando Valley, Topanga Canyon, 
and I went occasionally I wound up at a place where they were doing porno movies and this that and the other not the not the actual movies but the offices where they were because they somebody would give me the name and I would go into this office and there's all these people the stars of these various movies that were being featured uh -huh. on the walls and I was like I'm supposed to interview so and so to determine if so and so is entitled to a security clearance, which uh -huh. was pretty comical all the way around, as far as I was concerned. Well, did, did you have occasions where you didn't grant security clearance to individuals? Oh yeah, and there were there were a couple of occasions where I uh, had the up had the responsibility, not the opportunity, the responsibility to interview people who had come from uh, Iron Curtain countries and were attempting to get security clearances and that was one of the things that that I did as well. Okay. So yeah. Well how long did you do that? At, uh, in, in I California? did that until uh, January of 1968 when I went to Vietnamese language school. In the meantime there were I met the following people you because you and I talked about this before I knocked on the door of this place in the Hollywood Hills and the guy that opened the door was Bob Newhart, which was kind of a neat thing. And then... Well, why were you at, at that grade? Because his, I, I, was, I didn't know he was there. His sister-in-law was the person I was supposed to interview about somebody else. Okay. And then I had to go in further into the Hollywood Hills and I came to a house and it was a beautiful home set back and was fenced and everything else and I walked in and I'm looking around this place and it was like this is really neat and I turned around to go to the front door of this house and I'm looking at two Dobermans who are standing there looking at me and a voice honest to God first time I ever had this kind of an experience <clears throat> voice came out of the trees, who are you and what is your business here? <laughs> I'm here to interview Mr. Kelly Johnson. You'll find Mr. Johnson at Lockheed in Burbank. So that was the next thing. And then I went a little further because I had one more to call, call to make. And I went down the hill and I get to this place, and this, uh, this is not nearly as nice. It's kind of a kind of a. It's an average home. Well, not quite that good. It was just one of the shacks that they had down there, going towards Malibu Beach. Uh. And I knocked on the door, and I voice came from up above, and I looked up, and there was a young lady standing there with her that was not wearing a bikini top. Now that was something that made me very nervous because <laughs> if she made some comment about that, I said, please put on your top and come down here. I have to ask you some questions. So she came down and she told me that she had been in beach blanket bingo with Annette. And that Funicello? Yes, oh, there Lord. we go. That's very nice. Do you know so-and-so? Oh yes, she's working. I said, oh good. Where so I these a lot of these things, when I would get the information, I couldn't follow up because they were working in some other district or some other detachment's location, and I would refer it to them. Okay. So then I went back to see Mr. Johnson because I had the fellow had made the arrangements. So I get there and I'm talking. To, I walk in and they tell me that Mr. Johnson will see me. And I, I had no idea who I was going to talk to. It turns out I was Kelly Johnson, the guy who developed the U-2. Oh, wow. And the SR-71. And I said, Mr. Johnson, I'm here to interview you about so-and-so. He said, hey, Fred, or whatever his name was, come on over. I said, I can't do that. I have to interview you about what you know about him. So... <laughs> that was it. And then the, the final one I want to tell you about, because this was probably the most bizarre. 
sometimes you would get this little, what they called a Twix. A Twix is a flimsy piece of paper with just a bunch of information on it, and you're supposed to talk to somebody. My commander was George Sinclair at the time. <clears throat> George handed me the paper and told me I was supposed to interview this guy, and I look at it. I said, are you sure? He said, why? He said, oh, it's just, it's just a standard interview. I said, okay. So I go down, I make an appointment with this guy. And I go in and I'm wait he makes me wait for a month, about an hour and I'm like, so then they put me into his office and I'm meeting General Curtis LeMay. <laughs> wow. I popped him a salute. You don't salute civilians. Jesus. General LeMay, you're, you're the man that everybody dreams about. Who are you? What are you here about? I'm here about so-and-so. Don't you realize? Are you people, idiots, jerks? What? And I'm like, sir, all I have is this flimsy piece of paper. I said, who is this man? He was a general of the Air Force. And he's going on and on, and he's just ripping me up one side and down the other. And I'm standing there, and I'm standing at attention, because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Finally, he said, okay, ask your, ask your stupid questions. I'll go. And one of the questions was, did you ever see the person drink so, too much? And by that time, I was fired up as well. So I'm asking him, and I get down, and I ask him that one, and I go down two more. I go back, and I ask him that one again. Now, he's turning about as red as your shirt. I'm turning about as red as your shirt, and I want to get the hell out of there as fast as I can. So anyway, I go outside, and I got, I got some money. I finally finished this. It, I was supposed to be there at 9 o'clock. He kept me until 10.30. Just, whew, anyway. So... I call now. I call George on the cell on a on a telephone, not a cell phone. I call George Sinclair. I said, "Well, George, I just met the fellow." He he said, "Well, who was it?" I said, "Curtis LeMay." What? <laughs> Didn't you? <laughs> he says, "You better call Colonel O'Connell." He said, "What did you do?" I know how you are. I said, "Okay." So I call the guy at at, at Norton Air Force Base, Colonel O'Connell. And I said, Colonel, I said, uh, I have a feeling you may be hearing about me. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Agent Stiskel from uh, Oxnard, 1806. That was the detachment number. And I said, I have just interviewed General Lee May about an individual. Oh, really? How'd it go? I said, oh, I think you may hear about how it went. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't tell if he was angry or laughing, but he made me afterwards a couple of weeks later, I had to drive out to Norton and meet him. Now that leads me to Vietnam. Well, what was it, what's about this uh, this meeting? He said to me, he said, "Young man," he said, he said, "I," he said, "I have not heard a word about this." He said, "However," he said, "I want to know what you did," and I started to tell him. I told him almost word for word. And he started to laugh. <laughs> he said, you got more balls than brains. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir? <laughs> what am I going to say, you know? So... At least in Vietnam. Yeah, because... I got orders in... I was looking at a Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing, just because it just looked so neat. It was down in, in the Topanga Canyon area, and I was thinking about buying it. Thinking that you were going to be stateside? Yeah. I got back to the, and I said to the guy, I said, I'll, I'll get back to you, I'll call you tomorrow. I said, I'll let you know. The price was worked out, everything was worked out. And I got back to the base and I get orders to Vietnam. So I called him up and I said, I don't think I'm going to buy the car. <laughs> well, so, how, how soon did you have to go to Vietnam? 
I had to go to Vietnamese language school in Washington, D.C. at Berlitz. The uh, Berlitz school was up on 17th Street, uh, pretty close to Lafayette Circle, as I recall. And how long did you have to do the language from school? Then, from then, uh, from January until twenty fourth day of May, nineteen sixty eight. So this is your this is your uh, diploma from language Supposedly, school. Supposedly, yes. Uh, Three hundred and sixty five hours of instruction. In the 40, Vietnamese 48 language. hours a week. Now, interestingly enough, and one of the things that when you and I first started talking about this, it's an immersion course. So you're not allowed to speak anything but Vietnamese. So what do you think the first thing you learn in Vietnamese? I'd be afraid to guess. I gotta go to the John. <laughs> Toi Phi Di Cao Tiu. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it, I was very fortunate because I picked it up. There were a lot of the guys that were there that did not. Uh -huh. But I found out that the reason that I had been given the assignment to the Defense Research Institute Language School in Vietnam was because of Colonel O'Connell. Okay. He wanted me with him in Saigon. Okay. He got over there. And he became ill. The heat, he had got heat prostration or something. I don't even know what, because I never found out what. But I found out that he was, he was really kind of pleased with the fact that I was kind of a gutsy guy and didn't much give, didn't much, <laughs> he just thought that was kind of neat. So that's how I, that's how I got the assignment, I think. And uh -huh. I mean, that's what I've been led to believe. And so, so let me ask you, uh, are, are you given any leaves to go home before you uh, complete oh, yeah. this language no, school? No, after, after you complete it, yeah, they give you a week or so. All right. And when I flew, when I flew over... Flew over to Vietnam? Yeah. Where I, from? I had to go to Seattle, Tacoma. And I flew to Japan. Did you fly, milita thought, did you fly military or commercial? Commercial. That's what almost everybody did at that time. And I believe, because I was so confused by that time, because you're, you're changing time zones, you're changing this, you're changing everything. Day comes night, night comes day, it, you know, on and on. Anyway, <clears throat> I got to some place and they told me I had to go to jungle training. So this is in Vietnam? Or I don't know, still I think States? so. I think I think I was in Vietnam. I can't tell you for sure. I think I landed at Bien Hoa, and they put me back on an airplane right then, and flew me someplace. And I thought it was Hawaii because uh, I've talked to several people because there is a jungle training school in Hawaii somewhere, but nobody will ever tell me where. Uh -huh. Anyway, so I get there. I get to the air base at midnight and I'm transferred to a helicopter and flown out to this jungle school. training site yeah at which point nobody knows who you know at that point by that time you have no idea who you even are because you've been up so long and you're so hyped and so nervous and so concerned and now they send you to this freaking jungle jungle training it's training site and you really you know, you, now what am I going to be doing? So they get you out and then they, they strip you, they do all this stuff. Anyway, so the best, one of the best stories I have comes from that because that's where I met Jim Grimsley. He's at the Jungle Training School too. So the two of us are part of a squad that's supposed to be sneaking around going, finding this location, this secret location, and if we find it, you know, we're, we've done our job. This is after a couple of days of training.
Now, you, let me interrupt you here a second. You didn't know Grimsley before this? Hell no, no. First He's, time you met he him. Is a, he, I didn't know he was a lawyer until eight, ten years ago. He's an attorney in Destin, Florida now. Or is that, he's, I think he's retired. Anyway, Grimsley was the point man on the patrol. We're carrying phony weapons. And he's walking down this jungle trail. It's heavy, heavy wooded trail, I should say, not jungle, jungle. Heavy wooded trail, and all of a sudden, he disappears from my sight. Uh, did he go up? Did he go down? I hear <coughs> things going down through the brush. Turns out, <coughs> then he says, we all have some rope with us. Everybody's got all these things because that's what they do. They give you this equipment and you're supposed to use it for the, to do this secret stuff. So <coughs> I hear Grimsley, he's down the, down the hill a ways. Hey, what? Throw me a rope. So we figure out what he did. You know those huge lanai leaves that they have out there? Okay. He Step stepped on, on one. And, and just, then, whoosh, it was wet. Oh. He just went. He didn't go into a pit. He went down a hill. Yeah. So, of course, they captured us, beat us up, this, that, and the other. And five, six days later, I don't even know when, they turned us back, sent us back overseas. They had some. They had some BS stuff that they were doing, and they they also had some some uh, training with uh, videos and, and uh, pictures and this that and the other. Anyway, so we're we're there, and and they had showed the, show us this secret house where the Vietnamese intelligence people meet with us on a secret basis and so forth and so on. And they, and they hype this thing. Okay. So now Grimsley leaves first. He flies out. I leave the next day. I fly out. I get to Cameron Bay. You and I have talked about that. Now already I'm a little bit concerned because I've, I'm feeling very, uh, very aware of my potential situation and things, you know, we're going to be in a combat situation, this, that, and the other. So I get off the airplane, they hand me my bag and we're going on. We get on the bus. The bus has heavy duty chicken wire. I said to the guy, what's that for? He says, oh, that's in case they try to throw grenades in the bus. I said, oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I said, uh, OK, so uh, where are we headed? So he, he drives the bus. He takes me to another airplane. The, the aircraft that we were dealing with was a C-7 Caribou, which is a, which is a twin-engine de Havilland aircraft. And we were dealing with C-123s and C-130s. C-123 is a heavier duty twin-engine aircraft. And the C-130, of course, is a C-130 because they're still flying around. You see them, the, the four-engine, the, the turboprop, they can haul thousands and thousands of pounds of material. And they are a very effective piece of equipment. So now. They, that flies me up to Queen Yan. Well, now, how many people are with you when you're taking that flight? They just dropped us off into. It's like a typical airport in many ways, except that it's kind of not real nice. Okay. So, so you're going up to Queen Yan by yourself? Yeah. With no, the there's other people on the airplane, but I'm just. I'm the, just me. Are you the only intelligence guy there? I have no clue. Okay. And I'm, dry, I'm not wearing a uniform, I'm now wearing jungle fatigue, not jungle, I'm wearing standard green fatigues with a U.S. because I never wore an insignia of uniform on my uniform in Vietnam. You're not wearing a hat today, you never had one? No. 
No, nothing, none of that. It was U.S. because that was how that was how they knew you were intelligence. Okay, and also that was part of that was that if you were working with other intelligence services, they didn't know your rank. And if they knew you were a lower rank, they treated you like crap. Uh -huh. If they were, you were equal or above, then they gave you some respect. <laughs> And I just passed this past February or January, coming back from Florida, I ran into two guys in a Holiday Inn in Williamsburg, believe it or not. And we started talking. I said, well, you guys are here. You're here. What are you doing? Well, we're headed down. We've got assignments down, down the way. You know, no, nobody's saying anything specific, okay? I said, well, I see you. Uh, I see you're... You're a major, you're a uh, military uh, lieut uh, lieutenant commander. I said, uh, I said, boy, I said, years ago when I was OSI, I said, if they found out you were a lower rank, they treated you like shit. I said, if they thought you were equal or better, he said, we're in Europe and it ain't much different there either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I finally get to Queen Yon, and now I, they, they give me another hop to Phuket. Now, are they on this map? Uh, get your little, Cameron Bay, get no. Your, okay, Phuket. Queen Yon is right here. Okay, get your little pointer. It's on the chair. Yeah. Man, we lost your, we lost your voice. Uh. Queen Yon is right here on this map. Well, let me do this again. My fingers aren't working so very good. Okay, I got you. Queen Yon is right here on this map. And I never saw, didn't see Queen Yon at that point. Then they flew me up to Phuket Air Base, which is on this map right here. So then I get off the airplane, and they take me to the OSI hooch, which is just a little 20 by 30, 20 by 40 building. I'm introduced to Pat Hayes, Dick Lewis, Jerry, our uh, clerk, Frank Costa and Marv Poulton, the guy I was replacing. At that point, Grimsley comes to see me. He's been there a couple days already. He said, do you remember that secret house they were talking about? I said, yeah. He said, look over your left shoulder. There it is. <laughs> This two super secret place that's in the middle of the jungle and nobody can know about and all this stuff. Uh huh. You know. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> I'm there. So I figured this is just that they're just their BS deal in Hawaii or wherever we were, okay? Because that was just stupid. So we get anyway. So what? So what do you need? What's going on? They're going to say, well, well, we'll set you up later. We got to go to Queen Yon. Okay. They hop in. We hop in the jeep. They hand me an M16. You're going to ride shotgun. <laughs> I just, I just got there. I don't know up from down. Okay. So you'd have training on an M16 back in basic. Oh yeah. Okay. So we went to we went to Queen Yon, and uh, that's that's first time I saw Queen Yon. Queen Yon was a pretty nice city. They had. They had, uh, it was a huge uh, port for container ships, whatever, the Connex, we had things that are called Connex containers that contained supplies. Uh, that you would see them offloading those like crazy. The Navy had a group there for the swift boats. The uh, the army had a, had a series of units there. The army also the army also supply a supply depot, 
and they had su uh, several supply units there, which I saw. And then they told me about the Camp Radcliffe, I think it was, up in the hills. That's where the first air cav was. That's, they were basically the supply for the first air cav up in, I thought, I always thought, on K is two different places in Vietnam. On K is, the first on K that I knew about was up here. And after, after Tet, the first air cav, much of the first air cav moved up to another location up near Da Nang. Okay. That's like 800 miles, 500 miles north. Okay. Uh, so are you, in the, are you in the Air Force branch at that time? Uh, no, on K was was Army, and no, that was you, all helicopters. You yourself? Yeah, I was Air Force. Air Force, okay. Okay, I was in the Air Force unit. Uh, and anyway, after that, Mark Poulton had me, introduced me to Mr. Lynn. I have pictures of him, Mr. Lynn and Mr. And Mr. Tet. Mr. Tet was the Army guy who went out and collected the information from the various we had, a, we had an, an intelligence net of about 150, 180 people that lived all over the place here. And when I say all over the place, I mean all over the place. But you and I have talked about the idea of the issues of the, of the coordinates. So that's how, I, that's how I identified them. I would put those push pins like we have here where people told me that people were coming through. Now, you can't accept that one person is going to be right. You've got to verify stuff. You've got to cross-reference, cross-verify, cross-do things in order to understand what's really going on. Because you may, you may see something going on right here, and then you don't see anything for three or four days. Or you see something here, and then you see it here two days later. And then you see it here two days later. Well, now you have something which may have some, some validity and some veracity that you can run in, can have somebody run a check on. And who would run a check on it? Sometimes the Koreans, mostly the Koreans. The Korean base, which was right next to Phuket Air Base, uh, was the first Meng Ho. Meng Ho is Tiger. And it was the first regiment of the Mangho Capital Tiger Division. Now the <clears throat> Capital Tiger Division was the major, the major Korean military unit that was developed during the Korean War and was in very, very, it was very one of the toughest bunches I've ever seen. They weren't mean but they were sure determined. Uh -huh. And when I say determined, I mean, if, well, I, would go, I would go regular, Grimsley and I talk to these people on a regular basis. And I would go almost daily to their command post, which was right, literally right across the road, down the hill a little bit and over there, just to get it to see if there was anything that they had for me. Because I would give them stuff be, because they had people out there looking too. So we would share a certain amount of information. Anyway, I walk into this, and uh, Yuhan Gil was a young man. He was a, in training, he was like a private. And his back was turned to an officer. Now the officer, he didn't know the officer was here. The officer was just walking in the door. He, the officer walked in the door, said something to, to you, and you turned around and snapped to attention. The guy hit him with a swagger stick, knocked him to the ground. You popped back up into an immediate attention. So, I mean, these guys, there was no... Well, why did you whack him? That's just what they did. I <laughs> saw that several times, with, not just with him, with others. If somebody was not paying attention the way they thought they would, they had this stick about similar to this, but... Bigger and stronger. Yeah, and they would just they would just whack and knock the guy to the ground. The guy would pop right back up into an attention. I'm like, oh man, this is did, out of control. Did we have a lot of Koreans over there fighting with us? Yes, but they they did not fight with us. They fought. They were brought over by Johnson, 
is a group, and they had their own had their own agenda. Well, it's called no. There's there are things called SAORs and TAORs. A TAOR is a tactical area of responsibility. So they had a TAOR, and the SAOR is a strategic area of responsibility. The SAOR is more is a, just a larger area. That's all. <clears throat> and they at times had the SAOR for around Phuket, and they, but there was another group, the first Air Cav and the 173rd, I think, they were a little bit west of the Phuket. No, Phuket is the air base that Phuket's you pointed out. Phuket is the air base that I pointed out yeah. before. Okay. And so this area out here, all of this area is a very, very, very verdant rice growing area. And the Vietnamese are very industrious people. They, I have watched them. I watched one guy one time making bricks. He had six pieces or eight pieces of wood. And he was digging into this one area of earth. And he would put the first piece of wood down. He would then put up four sides. And then he would pour the brick in it, put the brick in it. And he would take it and put it to another piece of wood to sit. And then he would do it over again, over again, over again. He made 50 brick in the two or three hours that I was sitting there watching. I was waiting for something. I was waiting for someone to show up that did, who didn't show up. Another idea. Well, so they're making these bricks and they're just getting sun dried? Yeah. No, 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 nothing. no that's it. Ovens or anything, no. just sun dried. Sun dried. Another thing that they did. You know, GIs drink a lot of beer. I watched as people would flatten the cans in order to make roofing shingles. Their houses were all thatch. And the guy that was the most successful had all the beer cans that were the same. I mean, you know, these, these are things that, that absolutely impressed me no end, not because of anything other than the absolute determination and the willingness to work to make things happen. So this guy's roof was all one brand of beer? Yeah, his, his one, his, the one guy, his, one, his roof was, as I recall, it was Bud. <laughs> Everything was a Bud can. I mean, I mean so, now this, this kind of stuff sounds stupid 50 years later, but it's, it's the kind of thing that those people did. But most of the houses were thatch roofs? Yeah. I mean, they were... God help you if you left a two-by-four somewhere. You'd make, they'd make 25 pieces of wood out of it, you know? <laughs> and I watched them one time just south of Anyon. I want to get back to that. No, let's do that now. The size of this room is about 18, 12 by 18, I would say. They're about 12 by, maybe 12 by 20. Well, I'm gonna go with that first. I watched people start taking earth out of a, something about twice this size. Inside of two weeks, it was flattened they had rice growing in it, hmm. just with human power. Now, as far as the districts, what were the, I started telling you at one point about the districts, the, the Anyon and Phuket and these, these were military personnel, American military personnel who worked with the, what we would call the local indigenous personnel. Mm -hmm. The American military personnel were, would help, quote unquote, them. But they built things out of sandbags. These sandbags, they created rooms, they created living spaces, 
100 feet by 50 feet out of sandbags and plywood and sandbag tops and this, that, and the other. And there would be anywhere from 8 to 10, maybe 15 people, Americans, that were part of that military situation. And that was the same thing at Phuket and at Anyon. Anyon is a district right here. I know. There is Anyon, and Phuket's a district right here. Those, Phuket, Phuket district had a Catholic church. And the guy who was the priest at the Catholic church wanted to learn more English. And I wanted to speak better Vietnamese. So after several months, Poulton, by that time Mark Poulton was gone. And I was the guy sort of running the show. <coughs> I did not let Nguyen Quyen Lin, my supposed interpreter, and Tran Van Tet know that I could speak Vietnamese initially. One day, Tet came in. He was always 15 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour late, whatever. And Mr. Lin, who was a civilian, he turned to Tet and he said, and I'll never forget it, Yun me tong Tet, Yun I de yo. And I thought, holy shit. What he just said to him is, Tet, you motherfucker, you're always late. <laughs> And I reacted, okay? Yeah, but the other guy didn't, because he didn't know what he, he said. Nobody knew I spoke Vietnamese. <laughs> so, Lynn caught it. He said, oh, Mr. Bob, you know how to speak Vietnamese. Uh, oh, a little. <laughs> and now Ted, Ted was mad at him in the first place. Now, because he said that in front of me, he's really not happy. Uh. Okay, so now Ted's firing back at Lynn. And I just, I said, okay, guys, okay, okay. I do, I speak Vietnamese, I'm sorry, yeah, you know. <laughs> anyway, after that, things got a little bit, he got a little bit better about timing, and Mr. Lynn, Mr. Lin, whenever I was stuck on things, he would help me out a little bit. But he was mostly, my connection with the local people outside. Okay. So was Mr. Lin he was, assigned he was to you, yes, kind of, so to speak? pretty much. And then one night, One of the guys, whose name is Gore, he shall remain nameless. One of the guys went out, he just loved the kids. He got along with the kids so great, and all of the kids just loved him. He would take candy, he would do this, he would do that. And he had, and I, I told him, get rid of this thing, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of this damn thing. He had a grease gun. A grease gun is just a 45 caliber gun that's a bunch of pipes strung together. Uh. There's no way, there's no safety, there's no trigger, there's no nothing. All you do is you lift up the flap and the damn thing starts to shoot. Well, this guy got out of his Jeep, out of the Jeep that he had. I think he was using mine at the time. And when he did, the safety broke loose and fired a shot and killed a kid. Oh, a little boy? He, he, grew, he picked up the kid, brought the kid back on base. There was, there was no way to save him. So now, you know, the people are not happy. They're yeah. very upset. So I go out there to do the investigation. And it was not, it, it was not a, a pleasant thing. Mr. Lin was with me. And he wasn't very happy. And a grenade went off. I heard it, I heard it, and I knew what it was. And I go run it, I go jump in the Jeep and I go down there. 
and there's there's people injured. Well, we had a base hospital. So I threw a bunch of people in the Jeep, and I have, you know, you could ask me, you could ask me now, you could ask me 55 years ago, you could ask me 68, you could ask me in 68. I would have no idea how many people. So I took them up to the main gate, and the guards at the main gate, the security police, you cannot take those people on base. Okay, I'll leave them here. You cannot leave those people here. Well, then one or the other, we're either going to go to the base hospital, because I sure as hell ain't taking them back. So they called, Tom Kingston and I became very good friends after that. He was the chief assistant. He was number two of security police. But that night, he was not happy with me. Mm -hmm. You son of a bitch. What the hell do you think you're doing? I said, I got injured people. What do you want me to do? Now, who had caused the grenade? Well, there was somebody. There was enough armament running loose over there that nobody had any idea about. That you could swing a dead cat without you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting something that was going to explode. I mean, that's just what was going on over there. And this is 1968. So this is after Tet. There's all, and you got Vietnamese military, you got American military, you got Korean military, you got people that are over here for this and over here for that. It used to, I used to wonder how the hell anybody went down the road without getting killed, mm -hmm. if you want to know the truth. So anyway, we finally got them on into the uh, base hospital where they patched them up. And after Kingston thought about it for a little while, he, he forgave me. Mm -hmm. But the base commander never did. He was displeased. Uh -huh. but so that went, that went a long way towards pacifying the locals, didn't it? Uh, or did it? I didn't think of it that way. Okay. I wasn't worried about that. I just had some people that were hurt. Uh, anyway. So you were talking about the priest up here. Did, yeah. What, what? So so we got, I got him up there and he said, I want to take you someplace. Is it safe? Yeah, okay. He said, I'll, you, you'll be with me. So we go down to Phuket District, actually just about a half mile and a half away, the center. On the west side, there was a, an open well where the people got their water. There was a group of huts, more or less, on that side. There was a village market on this side. And so we went in, he, he would just walk, he got hopped out of the Jeep, walked over and sat down on a, something that resembled, it wasn't a chair, but it was something like a hogshead or something like that. And he says, come on in. So now I'm I'm nervous, but I'm not I'm not going to hide. I'm going to just what the hell? He can do it. By God, I can do it. So mm -hmm. I go in and I sit down, and uh, everybody's looking. You know, they're not used to this. Every GI, every American they've seen has guns and all this crap running around. I was wearing a uh, shirt similar to this, long trousers. I mean, I was armed. I had a, I had my 38 and I had a nine millimeter on me, but you couldn't tell. And uh, I'm like, well, okay. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, this little kid comes over and jumps up on my lap. And I thought, ciao, em. Ah, oh, me, no, it's Vietnam. And American speaks Vietnamese. I said, oh. So what's ciao, 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 and ciao, em? Yeah, hey there, little kid. Okay. Chow is hello in Vietnamese. Okay. So that was where the people started to accept me. There were not a lot of people they accepted as as in that way. Mm -hmm. But they accepted me, and they would tell me things. 
they would tell me a lot of different stuff about people who were dishonest, Americans who were sneaking off base and, and trying to get a little bit of uh, action, uh -huh. people who were bringing alcohol off base and giving it to them. So this became a very worthwhile little... It was a good source of information that you not wouldn't Not just information, but, but something where I could do something in behalf of them without it looking like some uh, something wrong, okay? Uh -huh. And there was an old lady and you know, when you look at people you can tell if they are accepting of you or, or not and her her countenance revealed that she did not have much use for any Americans. Let's put it that way. Uh -huh. So she was one that I always kept a watch out for because I never let her get behind me. I never knew, but she was just, whenever she saw me coming, she, <laughs> one of those, okay? And it was, she didn't hide her feelings at all. Well, that, that makes me think of a question about uh, the being in these villages and stuff, uh, did you have military guys that were killed by people they thought were friendly, but they really were VCs or oh, something? Oh, of course. Absolutely. I mean, you would... When I wrote up a little missive for you, a little letter for you to give you some of the idea of things, included in that is, is the story of the coffee can. And a lot of this stuff, it, I am no, I can't give you dates. I can't give you times. I can just say, I wanted to buy, buy a Minolta SRT 101 camera. Everybody, everybody over there had these, had the fanciest cameras you could get. You mean and everybody this, being the, every, the, all the military. Mil I military. mean, as you, you know, they had money to spend. They had no, no place to spend it. Well, where would they get them in? Base, expe base exchange on base. Ah. You could. They didn't have it in supply, but they had it. They could order it. So I, I ordered this in Minolta camera. And I went over it because I had thought, well, maybe it'll be there. And not only that, but at, at that time I smoked. So I got a package of cigarettes and I figured I'd pick up the camera. Well, it wasn't in yet. So, do you have any idea when it's coming? No, we don't know. We'll call you. Because the, the base had a telephone system, so they could tell you things. <clears throat> so we get to a certain point. And he, and anyway, as I'm walking in the door, looking for the first time, I see this cylinder, about so tall, Looks like one of our old aluminum, cores, aluminum coffee cans from the 40s. Same kind of lid, everything else, but no spout. And I said, oh, well, somebody left their lunch because the, the locals had these cans and inside that can there would be rice on the, in a small container there would be the meat or whatever, fish or whatever, that kind of stuff that would be in a smaller container up top. And then there would be some water underneath or some other stuff on I forget. It could have been soup, it could have been anything. Anyway, I walk, so I walk out, didn't think anything of it. Walk back, go back, hop in the Jeep, go back to the bay, go back to the office. And I'm, Wait a minute. I'm going to go back there. So I, I, it's around there lunchtime. So I go back there and I sit. I'm going to wait this out. If somebody comes to get lunch, it's okay. If nobody comes to get lunch, we're going to see what the hell's in that thing. So <clears throat> one o'clock comes. And how long have you been sitting there? half an hour, 20 minutes, I don't know. I just, I just was, it just troubled me, that's all. So then I called the EOD, Explosive Ordnance People. 
they bring some sandbags around, put it around that thing, they don't move it, and then they put something on top of it, and they very carefully lift the lid. And underneath the lid is a metal ball that's attached to a, a substance that's like an adhesive. And then they take that off, and there's a small battery, and underneath that is an explosive charge and about a pound of C4, which is a very explosive explosive. Mm -hmm. Would have wiped out, if there was people standing around, it probably would have killed 10 or 12. Anyway. So... So they, do they disassemble it? Or? They, just took, they just took the whole thing back. Afterwards, I, when I went to the, uh, their, their building a couple times, it was sitting there as their find. And that's okay with me. I don't care. But they had disabled the... Yeah, they the, had disabled. Uh, they had the different parts to show what had, how it had put together. Uh, <clears throat> after, you know, the, the, you and I have talked about the coordinates. So well, let, let me look at... On this map, uh, these lighter green areas are what? The, there, those are limits of various. Let's let's start a different way. When you when you are in a combat situation, the idea of the coordinates are the coordinates. These lines are lines of the coordinates that are identified by number and by letter. So if you look at it right here is a breakdown. Here is the breakdown zero. of zero zero. Yeah. Okay, here's the breakdown of zero, zero. That is a change. That goes from a change of B, which begins way over here at 1, to here, which is 99, and then we get to the zero. Now, that doesn't mean anything to anybody, and it, never, it didn't mean anything to you until we discussed it. And then the R is the vertical. So you, when you look at one of these maps, you will see that there's a 22, 23, 24, 20, whatever, going this way, and a 90, 91, 92, 93. So now, <clears throat> if you are a person in the military and you're under attack, you want to have someone come and help you. And that person can be a helicopter, that person can be somebody with artillery. That person can be someone with a with a an air force air, airplane. It can be one of any number of things. It can be a spooky. It can be a whatever. You called it a puff the magic dragon the other day. It can be any of those things. Spooky is the same thing as a puff magic dragon. It has many guns coming out of the side that can fire six thousand rounds a minute. Anyway. Each gun can shoot that much? Yeah, each gun. I'll get back to that. And at night when you see it, it looks like a fountain the, when they're firing. Because every sixth bullet is a tracer. That's why it looks like that. It looks like a fountain, a fountain of fire. Mm. That's an incredible thing. Anyway, so here you are at, you are at Bravo 90.5. Romeo 34.2, so 90.905342, that's your location. You don't want anybody shooting that location. You want them shooting some other location that's very close to that, but not that one. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to call somebody by radio and say, You'd be hiding yourself. Okay. There we go. I'm in deep trouble. I'm in deep trouble. I need somebody to come and take care of this. <coughs> Damn, we're not doing well.
Shoot. And so they say, what do you want me to bring? You want me to bring a Jeep? What do you want me to bring? You want me to bring a, a, a helicopter? You want me to bring a tank? What do you want me to bring? I don't give a rat's patoo what you're going to bring as long as you bring something that stops these people from shooting at me. So therefore, that's, that's the reason that this is a very important thing. And the people who have not had experience with the importance of a map and that's really what this amounts to, is not, not just the importance of the map, but what the map portends, what you can do with this map and what you can create, what the, the, the protection that you can create for yourself and others. And also, if you're going to go somewhere, don't you want to know where the hell you're going to go? That's the other thing. You want to know where I'm, I'm going to such and such a coordinate. That coordinate is very important. Now I told you long ago that when I first got, the first night I was in Vietnam, I was assigned to a bunk with a guy who was a spooky or a Puff the Magic Dragon pilot. And I went to sleep, I had finally gone, went, gone to sleep after many days of very, very little sleep. And I figured there was nothing that was gonna wake me up. Well, I was wrong because <clears throat> all of a sudden, just as I was asleep, the bed I was in raised up about this far and went back on the floor and an explosion that occurred that I thought was the end of the world. The first night you're there? The first night I'm there. So I jumped up, I threw on whatever clothes I could find as rapidly as I could and I'm headed down the hall because I'm looking for a bunker that I can go hide in. So <clears throat> I turned right to go down the hall. I came to the end of the hall and I threw open the door just as there's this other huge explosion. And I looked and I thought, one of those, you know, I'm dead. I figured I'm, I, I'm dead. This, this thing's going to kill me right now. And there's four other guys standing out there looking at this thing. The, over in the Korean camp, during the day, they had brought in a full battery of artillery, which includes 105, 105 millimeter yeah, one howitzer. of, howitzers. 155 howitzers, 175 eight inch guns and something, whatever else. I can't remember the rest of it. Anyway, <clears throat> the eight inch gun was firing into the mountains. Up this way. So I said to the one guy, I said, what, what are they shooting at? He said, I don't know, but whatever it is, it could be 20 miles away. I said, well, come on. He said, no, he says, that piece of equipment, that 8-inch gun can fire 20 miles, a 1,000-pound a projectile, 20 miles, and they could drop it into a wastebasket. I did not believe it at that moment. Well, I, it I didn't don't believe matter. it now either. It, it didn't matter at that moment whether I believed it or not. It just mattered that I was going to survive this However, since that time, I have been further advised that that is very close to the truth. Now, how do they do that? Is there some guidance system on the shell? No, hell no. It's just, they, once again, the coordinates are plugged in, and the shell, and the shell is fired. And it's going to land where the coordinates are. It lands in. where it's supposed to. Well, that... That makes, we were talking another uh, about, about bombs. The bombs, yes. Bombs being 
drop from 30, 40, 50,000 feet. You got inclement weather, wind, and all that stuff. But how does it land in the wastebasket? Well, you and I talked about this yesterday. And I tried to, tried to tell you, back in the Vietnam area, that area was not as much true. There was, and I can't tell you that how, how far up they were, but I can tell you this. When, a, when there is an arc light, that's what they call a B-50, back then, that's what they called a B-52 strike. When there's an arc light, the ground turns to plastic under your feet, and you can't stand up. It just starts to roll because of the quantity of bombs that they are dropping. It's the most, no, it's not the most amazing, but it's a, it's a hellacious thing to even begin to contemplate. Anyway, <clears throat> and the reason we were talking about it is because I had been, if we had also, you and I have also talked about how things are pretty quiet during the time when the moon is full and for a week or two before and a week or two after in the 10 days before the dark of the moon, that's when the enemy is most active because in Vietnam there was no light. There was no, no electricity or if there was, it was so minimal, you could probably do a 40 watt bulb and it would, you would be able to see it flatter, flitter. Anyway, <clears throat> I went to play coup and then to a forward base, and they were the Green Beret came out and he said, "Ask what the hell I was doing there," and they they said the guy that took me because he was an Air Force guy and didn't know better. He said, "Well, I brought this guy because he speaks Vietnamese." He said, "These people are yards. These are mountain yards. They don't speak Vietnamese. They hate the Vietnamese. Get him out of here." <laughs> Okay, so, so I just it, had to sit around. It. I had to sit around and wait until right. the, he got done with his job. But what had happened, according to the military, every, almost every bomb went right where it was supposed to, but one of them had hit what they claimed was a very dense air pocket, which caused it to just go off. Go off course. And it dropped close to the Monyard village and apparently killed some of their animals. And you, you know, you can kill people, but whatever you do, don't kill their animals over there because the animals are, are their life. That's their, that's where they, that's who provides the, uh, the, the, the power to do their farming. Everything. And, and, and afterwards you eat them. Mm -hmm. They don't worry about whether they're real tender or not. They just, you know, they, it, this thing has used, entered, entered its useful life, and so now we're going to eat it. So that's how that works. <coughs> and you, <coughs> you made a comment to me about the trade and about how they, how about what, how do they do things? Well, they exchange. They exchange pork for whatever, uh, rice for this. And they have 20 or 30 different types of rice over there, and each one is for a different type of dish. But the average person is just a subsistence, yeah. just trying to stay alive. Well, they, and they do pretty good. I mean, uh, that, the guy doing the brick, the guy doing the, the uh, well, what's roof. He do, what's he doing the brick for? Are there, are there houses made out of brick or he, mud or what? No, there was, there was he, I have believe I have no I cannot tell you because I didn't even ask him. I was just fascinated by the fact that here he is making this brick. I think maybe for a, for a, uh, a building of some sort, but what kind I don't know. Well, on your map here, we've got different shades of green: the lighter green and the dark green. What what are the darker are the... green is the is the lower. It, there's also little lines, tiny little lines on there. That's the lower elevation. And then you get to the lighter green and there's the higher elevation. And then you see the brown up there or the tan colors and that's an even higher elevation. But, so, but there are also ways between, there are little 
valleys and so forth that are, that let people go between things on a regular basis. They, 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 it's an amazing. The country itself is absolutely gorgeous. If you took this area where I was. And you and you didn't have to worry about getting shot at. It's just a beautiful area, and the people are not—they are not hateful. They've been fought over so many times that they don't seem to be very concerned about it. They just figure sooner or later it's going to be over. Mm -hmm. Then maybe somebody else will try, but they don't seem to—they don't seem to get upset. Is not the word. They just don't seem to get really concerned. Well, were you in any areas of combat? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. I told you, I, in my little letter to you, I said, I told you about working with the rough buffs. Regional force, popular force. These are just a bunch of farmers like, like our National Guard and reserves and that kind of stuff. But at a much lower level, we just wanted to try to, to train them to protect themselves. That's all. And Grimsley, that was one of Grimsley's things. His 821st Safe Side Group, well, that was one of their things. The, that they wanted to provide some back, some stuff for them. And so the, they set up this defensive position, and we're there to try to Show them, you know, okay, this is what you do. I told you I got, this is where, that's where I got this. <clears throat> so you're setting up stuff, you're, you're doing this, doing that. And then we, I sort of figured out later that basically what had happened is one of the farmers decided to tell everybody. So the VC found out about him. The E210B Battalion. That was just one of the local VC units. And so they started to come in. <clears throat> and we were set up off a road, you know, to, to tell you now where I was set up. All I, was, all I can tell you is I was set up in a place where I could defend the rear, I could defend the sides, and I could take care of the front. That's the best thing I can tell you. And how many is in your group? About 100, 120. Are, are you in charge of that group? Hell no, I'm just the... Interpreter. I'm, ju I'm just the interpreter. Halt, don't lie, shout, stop. Shung Liang Trong, shoot the, shoot the machine gun, whatever, you know. So, we had, when you set up a defensive position, there are flares you set up out front, way out. For trip wires and stuff? Trip wires and that type of stuff. And when you set up the trip wires, somebody comes in and they, they hit him. And the, and the way that these trip flares are set up, the, there is constant tension. So if there's less tension or more tension, they go off. And there are times when animals get in there, there's times when other things happen. But as soon as you have a trip flare go off, then you start popping your own flares. You know, you have pop, what we call pop flares. You just, and they go off. They, and they show lights, show what's going on out front. And there were some rather unpleasant people out there. So that's when things started. But there were also people trying to get around us. That's, that's, nobody understands that part. You can do real well in your, in your combat situation. You, control in the front. But how the hell do you control the rear? So that's where we had some of the heaviest stuff was on the sides and the rear. And so that really uh, just discouraged them. In the meantime, the people in the front are catching hell too. So that then we called Spooky. And we told Spooky we'd like to have a little assistance here at this location. Now, are you doing the calling? No. You're, t you're telling somebody on the radio? Yeah, we need, we need some support here. And that's what we did. But you're pinpointing it on the map? Yeah, 
Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're pinpointing it, telling Grimsley. Yeah. Grimsley's calling Air he's, Force. He's, got, he's calling the, he's, no, he's got Spooky's uh, call signs and he's telling Spooky, come on over, we need some support. Okay. And when these people started to hear Spooky, you start to see people's knees waver. Because up till then they were feeling pretty spunky, like they, they may have a chance. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden things didn't look so good, so they started to back off. Okay. But that's, but, but that's, did, you know, I mean, you're, you're shooting, and frankly, one of the things that no one un really does understand, there are very few clear targets in a combat situation. Because if they're clear targets, they're gone. Especially in the jungle, yeah. Yeah. So you don't get clear targets. You get targets. You get you get flashes of target. So is that, and, you, is and that, muzzle flashes. Muzzle flashes <clears throat> when you're when you're in a spot where you're below all of the other stuff, they can shoot above you all they want to. But you've got you're below that. And they can't, they don't understand. Initially, they don't understand what to do to get to you. It's almost like being in a pillbox. Okay, but you, because you can see them, you can see them, you can see the muzzle flashes of them mm -hmm. much better than they can understand where you are, mm -hmm. is the best way to say it. Because you fire back. Well, you wait, you're not, when you get to a certain point, you ain't waiting. You're just saying you're, you're, You'll see some things going on out there, and you see a muzzle flash, and so you start taking action with that. And if there's one there, there's probably more there. So that's that's your clue, or yeah, that's your cue to make some things happen. Now, when you were in this situation where you had to call Spooky in, did he, did that plane come in and, and fire on the enemy, or he? Yes, or he did. He did. But that was not the one that I met that I, you and I were talking about before. <clears throat> he came across. When Spooky comes across, for the first thing he's going to do is he's going to recon reconnoiter the area. He's going to check and see what's going on there. And if he sees a bunch of muzzle flashes back and forth, then he goes off a little bit because the weapons in his machine are on the left-hand side of his aircraft, okay? They're not on the right side. So he comes across on the left side, goes around one time, and comes back, but he's a little further off. And then you, he'll, he'll fire a test, test round, test six second, 10 second fire in order to, and, it's very impressive because when he does it, it comes right at you and then it does this. Go in front of you. So yeah, but the one that was the one that was most effective, I guess, is the one with the Koreans because they called him in on Nui Maha. What's and that? Maha is a mountain I, that I put the little circle around. Let's see here. Where's the base? That right here. There's the base. There's Nui Maha. That was that place. Somehow they got there all the time. I have no idea how. The VC? VC and VA. And, uh, so the Koreans, <laughs> they're always calling in spooky on the mountain there? Well, yeah. That mountain was honeycombed with people. And tunnels? Tunnels and this, that, and the other. Did you get up in that mountain at all? Or is this just... Oh, yeah, that's where I was. I was there for interrogations. They'd, they'd snag somebody and I'd talk to them. But it, it, no, most of the time I recognized that it was a nobody sign, nowhere. Mm -hmm. So you know, wasn't, they didn't want me to waste, their, to waste my time. But if, I, if they got somebody that had something, then they'd start with me, and then I'd turn them over to Pot. He's right over there. 
Fox there. He's <coughs> Fox. I said, "You can tell me. You're going to tell him. I can tell you. If, I can tell you right now. You're going to tell him." Well, was he a Korean? Yeah. Tell me about the major. <coughs> Who brings this major to you? Oh, that was uh, that was Pot. He said, "You start on him. He went to somebody else." He had been to UCLA. Pac had. Mm -hmm. He he was a. I don't know if he was a graduate. You know, when you start dealing with these people, and they tell you things, you're a little bit uncertain as to what's the reality. But his English was excellent. And I don't know if he was a graduate or what, but he went to UCLA for a couple of years, and he lived in the States. Mm -hmm. And the reason we got to be friendly, there was a time when I was up, and it wasn't at Nui Maha, it was up in this area, somewhere. I can't tell you where. I wish I could. And we had snagged some people. Well, he, they had killed a bunch. And the Koreans, I hated it. But they'd lay out bodies and they lay out equipment and guns and all this stuff. I'm like, you know, show some respect. You, you, you won. Show the respect to these people. You, you don't have to do this. And somebody shows up in a press helicopter and, and rotors down. They, they auto rotor down. And the press helicopter said, press. I go, wish I had my own helicopter. <clears throat> so he looks at, Pac looks at me, Park, Pac, whatever. He says, I don't know any English whatsoever. You take care of these people. Mm -hmm. So he brings you this guy. No, no, no. At, this, at that point, the guy with the press from the press helicopter gets out and they're taking pictures and they're taking pictures and they ain't taking no pictures of me. I don't give a damn who they are because that's, I ain't supposed to be there in the first place. According to the government? Any government. Yeah, I'm not supposed to be there. So the guy says, uh, who are you? I'm military assistance command Korea. <laughs> I came up with that. I have no idea how. <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I live. Anyway, he says, he says, does he speak English? And not a word. Do you speak Korean some? So, and I do speak some. I, have, I can give you Yoba Seo, Anyung Ha Seo, Anyung Ha I can do some of that stuff. I, you know, where, where's your wife, whatever, that type of stuff. But I can't do a real heck, heck of a lot. So he says to me, he's, he walks over to Pac, and he grabs hold of Pac's arm, and he goes, Korean's very strong. And I go, holy God, this guy's going to get killed right on the spot. Because Pac would not put up with that for a second. You don't touch a Korean. Mm -hmm. If you touch a Korean without their permission, it's, it's a real violation. <clears throat> so, I see, and he, I have him in here, he, I have his picture. And you can just tell he's not a, hap, he's not a nice guy, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. He was with me and he was many times, but not, that, not at that moment. Anyway, I've got, I finally got myself in order so I can't, they can't get my picture. And this guy's taking a picture of all the dead people and all the guns and all this stuff. And uh, after a little, I said, you, I said, we're getting ready for some more action. You better get out of here. So he gets on his helicopter and goes off. Pac says, where do you come up with military assistance coming out of Korea. I said, I, I know a guy who's a court reporter in Youngstown who served with the Koreans in Korea, and I once asked him what he did. And he said he was military assistance command for the Korean army. 
<laughs> I, you know, it's it's. It, it just hits you. Oh yeah. It hits you it all of a sudden. Yeah. So <clears throat> he's the guy that brought me. He brought me this fella who I thought was more his responsibility than mine. And so we went back and forth, you and, and he wouldn't tell me anything. You he, and the prisoner? He, me and the prisoner, yeah. We went back and forth, and he wouldn't tell me anything. He For how me, long were you doing that? An uh, hour, two hours. I mean, we're in the middle of a damn combat zone. There's shooting going on over here, over there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was, he was slightly wounded, and that's the only reason we got him. And then Puck comes over, he says, I'll take over. I said, okay. He said, but he said, if there's anything, I'll, I'll let you know. So two weeks later, a week later, he brings him over to me. And then I interviewed him in the Korean camp. And as I told you, that was the... Uh, that was the first one of my interrogations that appeared in the intelligence, intelligence journal over there. Mm. I had three or four, and they were all pretty much similar, just just like we're doing here, talking. But tell me, tell me about your interview with this guy. He hadn't talked to you two weeks before that he wouldn't tell you wouldn't tell me, the time of day, yeah, right. and two weeks later... Well, the Koreans had a store of people that went that they had at their main compound at the division headquarters which was someplace else i never never saw it they don't know anything about it uh, he was taken there and there were people that were in his command that knew him other 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 prisoners. Prisoners that knew the guy and they, you had And they started, just tell them what they know. They know all of us anyway, is basically how I guess it started. So at that point, he just sort of fell, he didn't fall in line, but he, he wouldn't, there's things he wouldn't say. He had things he wouldn't tell. But the, the some of this, most of the stuff was just standard military stuff. Mm -hmm. And he came to me, and then Pac says, well, you started, I'm going to give them back to you. So I went back over to the Korean compound, and that's where I interviewed him. And people would think there were so many times. This way, so you're still in the, good in the camera. Okay. There were so many times that I would go to the officers' club. I'd have a meal, have it, have them set up a drink. Uh, this the American officers' club or I, Korean? American. The, uh, on, on the uh, Phuket Air Base. And I'd have them set up a couple drinks, drink one, and be gone. And I'd go over to the Korean camp. Or I'd go to Phuket District, or I'd go to Anyan District. Because there was something going on that, that I wanted to find out about. And it wouldn't, I didn't give this stuff much of a much thought, except that I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing. It's and Grimsley occasionally would say to me, "What Besi the hell are you doing?" So besides Grimsley, did anybody know what you were doing? They would see reports in Saigon. Did you have any kind of a secret name or anything? Oh, I was spooked too. Aside from that, no. I never, you know. You know how you the, got the the reason that I did some of this stuff, the way I did it, is just because I felt very uncomfortable about people knowing, because they were all nosy. They all wanted to find what, what, are, you, what, what are you really doing. And that's what put me off, more than anything. I was like... What business is it of yours? Yeah, you know, more like go shit in your hat. 
you know, it's like that. That basically my attitude about stuff like this. I don't, you know, you don't, you, you know, I don't owe you a nickel. I don't owe you one explanation. Well, tell me about the time uh, you're you're in, in combat and you shot somebody. That was in the, with the Koreans up in here. That's one of the few times I actually saw the guy that I shot. Some of the others, you don't know if you hit somebody or not. Because when, you, when morning comes, there's nobody there. Because they've taken all the dead away? Yeah. They don't so want how them. do we get these body counts that the, the that's, newspapers... That's, would... Well, that, now that's a very good question. The reason you get body counts is because some, some of them were made up. I'm sure. That's all. I'm sure. That, and, and they would go over the, this arc light thing I told you about. The guy came in, he was with Intel, Army Intel. He said, well, a couple, couple hundred people died on, over there. How would he know? I don't know. I, I don't... Oops. Were, 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 were they, anyway. Were, they, were we getting... No. The public, were we getting accurate body counts on our no, own men? No, and it men? didn't matter. Body count doesn't mean anything. What matters is... Well, it did from a publicity standpoint, didn't it? I, I, wouldn't, want, I wouldn't tell you Jack if, I, if it were me. I read you. It, but the, you but, don't have any. Basically, you have no way of of evaluating. But as far as one twenty two rockets, okay, one twenty. Everybody was panic stricken over these freaking one twenty two rockets. What are they? There might be ten of them fired on a base. Well, what is a one twenty two rocket? It's a rocket. It's a rocket about this size. It's supposed to be the the death knell of anything around the area. Well, it's just another damn rocket. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a big mortar, a, a 155, 105 millimeter shell. It's just something in between. But when I, I can remember seeing the USA Today or one of these places where they said, oh, they're firing 122 millimeter rockets. And I go, I was in a location one time where a 122 rocket hit. If you happened to be within 100 feet of the damn thing, you were in trouble. Other than that, and there were not enough of them at any time to do any real damage. It's not like you see these, these warfare things from the Germans where they would fire like 50 of these rockets off. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about some individual thing where they can fire five or six of them. The same, the, I'll tell you, the, the worst than that is the mortar. The mortars are just nasty. That, that's, Our and, mortars or their mortars? Yeah, anybody's mortars. When you, when you start with a mortar, they can, they can just set a mortar down, put it on a stanchion, and crank in certain changes. And every one of those changes is going to have the mortar go 10 feet, 15, 20 feet, whatever, however much further they want it to go. And as I said to you, the, 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 the problem that, what was Joe, <coughs> that was, became, he became a uh, Court of Appeals judge in, on the 7th District. And he was, a, he was in on K, Camp Radcliffe. And I said to him, I said, okay. What's the, what's the worst thing he says you got back to the, we used to call it the world. This was the world, that was someplace else, but mm -hmm. this is the world. So what was the worst thing when you got back to the world? He said, cars, in, cars driving in the rain. It sounds like a goddamn mortar. I said, yeah, it does. Because uh, it's, and even today, if, I, if I'm have going through a little flashback type of thing, because of something that I see, and something that's raining like crazy, and the car comes by and it's going like 35, 40 in the, in the rain. <laughs> My butt tightens right up. It's just. Really? Even today? Even today, 50 years later. Wow. Well, t uh, tell me about the difference between 
mortar shells that can burst above ground okay. and on ground. Aerial versus uh, impact. <clears throat> the aerial is generally, as I understand it, a, a uh, time fuse. Time, time fuse. And the impact is wherever it hits. The only ones that I really went through were the impact ones. And the impact ones, the problem with impact, the problem with mortar shells, any kind of shell is not the shell itself. It's, you know, if, it, if shrapnel hits you, if it causes injury, it causes injury. And it's going to be a significant injury. <coughs> but for the most part, the biggest problem is the complete disorientation that you suffer. And the and because your your ears are all screwed up, concussion. you can't stand up. The concussion, you can't stand up. You can't. You stand up and you fall down. I one time I stood up and fell down in mud twenty times. I said, stand up, fall down. I I looked like I somebody was somebody had was trying to make Mr. Mud Man out of me. And, and finally, when I got up and I was able to stand, I was still groggy. Was that from an impact mortar or uh, above ground? I never saw, I never suffered an aerial. We had, at Phuket, Kingston, I can't remember the colonel's name, but Tom Kingston and I got to be close friends in spite of our occasional issues. He was from, Calais, Maine. I said, you mean Calais? He says, you, 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 are you one of those... That term is not coming to me. But are, you, uh, are you one of those uh, people? And I said, no, I'm not one of those. He says, well, up here in Maine, we're tough. We call it callous. Oh. I said, okay, anyway. They had constructed a, a roadway around the entire base and they had placed flares and this, that, and the other all over. Well, Kingston wanted to show us this, his road, one night. And so we hop in the Jeep. I get my uh, flak jacket or my flak vest on and I get my, my steel pot and this, that, and the other. And I get, on the, get in the Jeep with my M16 and we got a third guy that's sitting up there at the M60 because there's this just as a gun jeep. It's got an M60 up there, 30 caliber uh, machine gun. And I got my M16 and I got my nine millimeter and I, or nine, milli, nine millimeter 38. And uh, Kingston got his M16 and we start around. And up ahead we see some flares going off. Now we're halfway around the base, which is like a mile. The, the base is a mile? Or, no, the base, the base is a mile, this, this is a mile up. Oh. It's about a mile and a half, two miles long. So we're on our way up. And the next thing I know, Kingston jumps, pulls the Jeep forward and throws the headlights on this and there's a guy laying underneath his trip flares with a Bangalore torpedo on his back. Now, a Bangalore torpedo is just a piece of Pipe. bamboo filled with explosive. So, Kingston says to the guy at the M60, shoot that son of a bitch. Well, it just so happened that for some reason, completely unknown to a man, he fired a short burst and hit the Bangalore torpedo. Blew everything to smithereens, including the guy underneath, and lit off 5,000 trip flares. <laughs> <laughs> Kingston is now pissed. The, not for the reason that the Bangalore torpedo the guy got shot, but because all of his trip what? flares are screwed. Okay, and he's climbing out of the Jeep, he's swearing, and I said, Tom, now we start catching incoming fire, we start, people are starting to shoot at us, so they, they're apparently displeased that we've killed this guy. So, 
I'm down on the ground and I'm firing in the general direction of the muzzle flashes and that stops and now I know the Koreans are not happy because they figure that this is a matter of pride for them. You don't attack this base when we're here. So now we start getting flares from the Koreans. Now this is, these are 105 flares. What's a 105 flare? It's a flare, there's a, before they start firing shells to kill things, they fire flares so that the people underneath can get out of the way and there's a sequence to the flares. So by that time Kingston decides it's probably a pretty good idea to turn around and go home. So we turn around and we're headed home. Well, there's a watchtower over here. And I'm like, okay. So he pulls up to the watchtower. He just goes right up the steps. He figured, I don't know what he figured. He probably figured there was nobody in there. Well, there's been a little bit of commotion here. And there's been a lot of activity going on, so whoever was there should have been awake and should have been up and should at least be paying attention. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I know, there's something comes down and thumps in front of the Jeep. The guy was asleep and he slept through this whole thing. <laughs> I don't... I have, you, 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 cannot, you cannot believe that it was like, Kingston threw the guy out of the watchtower. He threw him out of the watchtower about 10 feet up. <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever. Because <laughs> there ain't, there's nothing I can do about this at this point. Plus, I want to get the hell out of there because I want, I'm figuring that we've seen the sequence of flares. Now, People are kind of excited, so they may start shooting real bullets, you know. <laughs> Get me the hell out of here. So, and that's something. Okay. People ask you if you're afraid. Fear comes to me before anything else happens. After that, you're so damn busy, you don't know, have any time to be afraid. And after it's all over and done with, it's too late. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to explain it because that night I wasn't afraid when they got when when the guy got blown on. up. Yeah, I was like, "Holy shit!" That was that was it. But then I figured, man, I better get the hell out of this jeep because he he's got friends with him. He's things are going to start happening. And I better get the hell away from here. So what did you do? I laid down on the ground and waited until somebody started shooting and started <laughs> shooting back. What else? Did you hit anybody? I have no clue. Well, now you told me about a guy you hit in the arm. Uh, that was the guy up in the hills and, and uh, the guy that I hit. I how, so many times, you have to ask you how many people you shoot. I have no clue. But you remember this guy. I remember this guy because when I hit him in the left arm with an M16 round, it blew off the entire arm. And he kept coming. How far away was he from you when you 75 first... 75 feet, 100 feet. When you first hit him? When I hit him. And did he drop? And, and that, no. Have sooner or later, he did after a bit. He, he made another 10 or 15 feet and fell. Did you have to shoot any more? I didn't shoot him anymore. What for? There was somebody else to, to shoot at, okay? Yeah. But at that point, there, I very seldom fired my any of my weapons on automatic. It just was stupid. Because if you, the once you fire, I, I told you about our little test with the uh, jer jerry cans. The, the well, jerry can you, you is. You wrote a, to me about that, but tell me about it. The jerry can is a tin or something can, aluminum tin, I think, can about a foot by a foot by a foot, and two foot tall. And Grimsley had 
gotten more of a connection with the Koreans than I had initially. Uh, and then, so then, anyway, we decided both, of, we were talking one day and we were saying, you know, how effective is this stuff? This AK-47, what's the deal? What's the big deal about this thing? Is it that good? And how about the M14? And how about the 38 caliber? And how about the 3030? Everybody, when I was a kid, you'd see everybody in World War II was carrying a carbine. Man, that looks really neat. So I said, okay, we, we set up, we got carbines, we got a carbine, we got an SKS, which is a, a Czechoslovakian uh, weapon that they use, which is their 30 caliber. We got the AK, we had the M16, we had the M14, we had pistols, we had 38, 9 millimeter, 44, 45, I think that was about it. Anyway. We went over and we started shooting. So we started with a carbine. Well, what was in the jury can? A, a gelatin. We put gelatin because gelatin supposedly is very similar to the human flesh, human human body. So that when it hits, it it produces the same result. So <clears throat> fire the carbine. Nothing. Fired the 38. Nothing. This is very disappointing when you're in a combat zone, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we get the M14, which is a 30 caliber slug. It's a seven, it's called the NATO round. It's a 7.62 30 caliber round that fits in almost all of them. It fits in an AK, it fits in an SKS. Fits in an M1, it fits in an S M14, it fits in all of these weapons. So, standard round. We hit it with the M14. The M14 rocked it and knocked it over and split a couple of the seams. The AK did about the same thing. The SKS did about the same thing. So we hit it with the M16. The M16 is a is a tiny bullet. It blew the top and bottom off one of those cans and split it wide open. Hmm. Much smaller bullet, but more power. Striking power was amazing to uh, uh, to us. Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe it. <clears throat> so we, so, okay, then we figure, okay, the M16 is pretty good. So then we start on the pistols. We start with the, we went back to the 38, the, the 9 millimeter, the 45. And once again, the 38 was, a, was very, very disappointing. Standard police issue type mm -hmm, 38. Mm -hmm. That's what we had. The 9 millimeter was pretty impressive. It, it split the, it, once again, it's smaller bullet or equal size. I no, it isn't. Slightly smaller bullet, actually, but it when it hit it, it rocked it. It was something that would stop something. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we hit it with the 45, and the 45 did about the same thing that the M16 did. But the difference is, and what this is what we determined, the 45 was good up to about 100 yards. Anything after 100 yards, it was not accurate. It's a very slow bullet. But, and sometimes, at, at times, you almost think you can see it leave the chamber. <laughs> I don't know for sure if you can, but it seems like you can. Uh -huh. And anyway, so those, but we did these experiments over a couple, over a couple of days. And it was very, uh, it illustrated a lot that we wanted to understand. So, what did the average GI have? Did he have the M14 or M16? He had the M14 or the M16. If they were doing away with the M14, they were using the M16. The M16 at that time had a problem because it was so fine. The AK-47, you could, and I did, throw it in the mud and pick it up and shoot. 
Well, I've heard uh, other guys say that the M14 had a jamming problem a lot. So did the M16. It did. It's too fine. It's too. When I say too fine, the tolerances are so close that unless it's clean, you can have issues. Mm -hmm. That's that. That is absolutely true, and it's true of the M16 as well. The SKS, which is a which is not a an automatic, a semi-automatic weapon, is a very very fine weapon, but it's semi-automatic. The AK-47 and the AK-50 were very, very good, very fine weapons and not something that you really wanted to play around with if you were on the other side. You said uh, you yourself like to do semi-automatic instead of automatic. Why was that? You want to hit something. The only, the only reason to fire an automatic is to have, to have everybody put their head down and stay down. Otherwise, when you start to fire in an automatic, it, it travels up like this. Because of the, re because the recoil? Of the re yeah, because, well, you're just, you're, if you're in a combat zone, a combat situation, you ain't freaking worrying about whether this thing is staying on target or not. You just want everybody to stay down. Leave me alone. I don't want to get hurt. Hmm. So you throw in an automatic and you figure, if, if, I'll get the hell out of the way. So, um. now the one thing that I always wanted to tell you about was the one. Well, let me let me ask you this. Okay. Uh, on the on the clips for the uh, for the M16, uh, what what size clips did they have? The standard clip over there was like a 14 round clip. The same thing was true. There was a nine round clip, a 14 round clip, and a 30 round clip. Everybody wanted the 30 round clip because they could fire it, they could fire it and fire it. But once you pull the trigger, it's gone. The, the bullets are gone. Yeah. What the hell's the point of that? You, you, <laughs> so what did you carry? I carried a 14 round and a two 14 round clips. Okay. And for my 9 millimeter, I carried the same type of thing, 14 round. For the 38, it was a standard 6 round. Well, I, I interrupted you. You were going to tell me something. We, Grimsley and I would, because of things, Grimsley and I would visit various places. We would leave the immediate area, and we would go up to the, some of the landing zones. Many people do not know that there were, off, there were many landing zones that were not a part of the official area, okay, where, where people knew where you were. They were not a large base. They were just a landing zone and a fire base for, for 105s or whatever. And so therefore, we would visit these. And the two we visited were LZ Uplift and LZ English. They were north of Phuket. So one, now where is that? I'll tell you right now. That's why I brought this because <laughs> I had a mark. Uplift was Bravo Romeo nine two four seven five two. Get your marker. There you go. Okay. Nine two four seven five two. Where's nine two? There's 9-2. And 7-5. There's 50. Right there. So you and Grimsley are up there? Yep. What are you doing way up there? Because your zone is down in here. Well, no, that was part of our part of our responsibility. All the way up there. All the way up there. We would go there to find out what they what they were experiencing. What's going on with you guys? You know, what what are you guys? You, how many people you got coming? How many people you got trying yet? What kind of a <clears throat> 
if you if you get somebody or if you kill somebody, can you find out who who they are or where they're from? Like whether they're VC or uh, MBA. Yeah. Well, that type of stuff. And so anyway, we would go up there about once a month. Infiltration by enemy combatants is not limited to the immediate area. And there was nobody else looking. There was nobody else doing anything. So what the hell? Let's find out what's going on. So we would go up there and we would go up to LZ English as well. That's even further north. It's not, in the, not on the map. So one day we left from the air base. We stopped at Phuket District about 10 o'clock. We talked to a couple of people there, and, and like I said, this is this is a not armored. This has got a bunch of sandbags and so forth. So we chatted with them for a couple of minutes, and I was said, we're going to go up to uplift. So we head out and we get across the demarcation line between I Corps and Two Corps. I Corps is the northernmost. Two Corps is the next one south. And right in that area is where the, at that point, because it changed at various times as to where I Corps and II Corps split. <coughs> but at the time I'm talking about, it was right in that, just north of Phuket District at a, at a river that ran across, Creek. So anyway, we head north. And as we cross into, into II Corps, into I Corps, we see two guys running. And the two guys that are running south look like wood carriers, but they also looked like they were not friendly people. Grimsley says, I'm going to notify Phuket and tell them to stop, get these guys and see what's going on. So <clears throat> we kept, we were headed up north. We had a radio, and this my Jeep was a little Jeep. It was a, like a CJ5 type of thing, and at that point, I had my f green fatigues on. I didn't, I wasn't wearing my standard uh, shirt like this. You've seen the pictures of me, and it's generally you see a picture of me with a shirt on and long trousers, and you see me with an ugly mustache. Okay, anyway, so we headed north, and. We get to this one hilly spot, and we start catching fire. Just the two of you in the Jeep. Just the two of us in the Jeep. Grimsley says, I see him. He says, I'm going to take him out. So he puts his M16 on my shoulder, and he starts to shoot. Like blow your eardrums out. Yeah, well. But anyway, I'm flinching, and he's, he says, I'm, I've got him. So anyway, and I, I'm on a hilly, I'm on a road where a hill goes up like this, a slight curve to the right, over, and I know I'm familiar with the area, so, and drop over. And I'm just hidden there, I'm just getting to the top of the hill. Grimsley, Grimsley's still shooting, because I knew I knew we were getting shot at because I see someone. So I see the bullets hitting the road behind us. And the reason I know, because I was going faster than what the normal person goes over there. Mm -hmm. I was doing like 40, 45, something like that. And mm -hmm. Normal the normal uh, convoy, 25, 30. They like, they aren't doing any faster because they, that's what they do over there anyway. So at, at that moment, as I crest the hill, a Huey's coming south, and it almost looks like it's at my eye level. Mm -hmm. And as he crosses over in top of, over top of me, he starts firing the M60 in the door. I'm thinking, <laughs> I have no idea where to go, what to do, or anything else. And I don't, I didn't. The only thing I was grateful for, I didn't shit my pants. Okay, that because it was one of those moments. So. The helicopter lands. I turn around, I go back, and he says, the guy says to me, what in the hell are you doing here? I said, and it's a colonel. In the helicopter? In the chopper. 
I'm in, I am reviewing what's going on in this, my area. I'm just taking over. I go, okay. So he, he's, he's hollering at us. I said, Colonel, I'm with OSI. Well, we do a, a monthly check to see what's going on up here, just to see, if, to see who's doing what and see if there's any, any activity. You guys are just, you know, blah, 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 blah. you know, you don't know what colonels are, but it's sort of like a judge. <laughs> <laughs> they just decide they're going to give you a bunch of shit because they can, okay? Yeah. So, guys, you guys got to get in that goddamn Jeep and get south. He says, there's lots of activity up beyond here. Okay. So you found out what you needed to know. <laughs> And we get back to Phuket, and we find out that when, that the guy they sent out, he went out by himself, and he got killed. And I felt terrible at, at, ever since. However, I read a book by this colonel. The Name same colonel. The same had to be, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Herbert, and the, called Soldier. And the reason I think it is, he didn't mention us, but he mentioned that he saw these two guys and he had stopped them. Oh, the two guys you thought were carrying wood? Yes. Okay. He had stopped them and he had turned them loose. And he found out later that there was a fellow who was assigned to Phuket District that got killed. There is nobody else that I know at any time that had that. Hmm. And they never did find out whether those guys were really bad guys or was just. Oh, somebody. I know they were bad guys. I knew that at the time, but I wasn't, didn't have myself ready to engage. If you want to know the truth, I said, Jim, I can't do it right now. I'm not. I don't have everything I need, mm -hmm. and I should have. Because mm -hmm. if I had, I would. I would have said, We got to stop. We got to see what those guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Grimsley said, I'll call Fukat. Well, another thing uh, that I hear a lot about is the uh, the, the uh, trail, the um, no, the Ho Chi Minh Ho Chi Minh trail. trail. Yeah, thank you. I had a <coughs> brain cramp there. We we talked a little about this before. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not just a road; it was trails, 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 all over the place through jungle everywhere. And basically, my, I was antagonized by what we were doing because I thought Phuket Air Base had super facts, forward air controllers that were F-100 super, supersonic aircraft. And they were sending these guys out to bomb the trail and to and to identify targets on the trail for for larger aircraft to bomb it. Well, the thing I didn't mention to you and I completely almost forgot, one of the things that I found out was that jet pilots have occasionally they get target fixation. And when they get target fixation they fly right into the target. They fly into the target? Yes. Crash? Yes. They're so intent on doing it that they literally fly into the target. And I'm just astonished at that. But that was one of the things that that I was talking I told you while well, you see in my little missive to you, my little letter to you, I, I wrote to you about a little party they had. Well the one guy either before or after that, flew into a freaking truck going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Or not quite, he, he actually didn't pull up after he made his run. Mm -hmm. But his, his run was so damn close. Crashed into the mountainside. Yeah. Uh, I remember you So that. It's like, you're mis this is a misapplication. If you're going to do something, and you said, well, you're not allowed to go to Laos. Well, let me tell you something. That's where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was. And so therefore, they would come down through Laos, and they'd wait to a certain point, and then they'd cross over. 
But the crossover point was like, it was like the western part of the state of Ohio, for the God's sake. Mm -hmm. any, they, any little creek, any little whatever that you could get stuff through, and for the most part, the people who did it were mules. They, they were the, you know, yeah. we had, I, and I mentioned also that we had, we did MedCap, Medical Civil Action Program. The doctors would go out and they would, would treat the local populace. And I would go out there too because it was a good way to see, if you see, do you have any trouble identifying a farmer? Well, from, the, from the appearance, the physical appearance? Well, yeah, usually they're uh, husky guys and they got Hus farm clothes on. Yeah, aside from that. They, they are, they appear strong, They're, they have good shoulders, they have this, they, yeah. they have strong legs. Well, that's the same thing you would get with some of these people that carry stuff for the VCMVA. You would see them and they would have shoulder straps, marks. And then they'd have a mark around their middle for the, some of the other stuff. And, and didn't really, they have marks on their legs, you told me? Of course. Me, from going through the grass? Going through grass and, and weeds and this, that, and the other? Yeah. And so that's what you would see. But then, it, since it was a medical civil program, I couldn't do anything about it at that time. And I wouldn't, because that would be a violation, not of anything to do with the military, but a violation of my friendship with the doctors. Couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But I sure as hell could find out where they went and find out. Mm -hmm. But. And sometimes I would tell the Koreans, and sometimes I would tell the MPs, and sometimes I wouldn't tell anybody. Because there were, there were things that, uh, that required a little judicial consideration of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, t tell me about uh, tell me about Laos. Uh, you said we weren't uh, officially in Laos. Uh, what what's going on well, that's there? Well, that's where the that's where the F-100s went. Well, did we have troops over there? Not officially, of course. Well, I can tell when I'm driving down the road. And I'm going from Ohio to Indiana because I have a sign, welcome to, <laughs> welcome to Indiana. But now how about going from Vietnam to Laos? How did you physically know? You didn't. Yeah. It's just another, you have a map. The map has coordinates. That's how you know. Um, were there, where were the, uh, where were the rubber plantations that I have read the, about? The rubber plantations were south towards Saigon. Uh, they went along the Mekong, north of the Mekong, and southern Vietnam was much less mountainous. I never made it down there to see, but I had I would get reports from from places. Well, you could see it on the maps too. Yeah. Of course. I went to Saigon on several occasions. <clears throat> the things that, it's just, people are people everywhere. I went there the one time, the guy picked me up at the airport at, at Tonsonut. I had to go see you, the colonel. I had gotten myself in trouble with the base commander again. So I had to go see the colonel and explain to him what I had done. What had you done? I had, uh, I had, I had to go to see him monthly, the base commander as part of the briefing. And uh, I went to see him at this point and he said, I don't know why you're wasting my time coming in here to tell me all this shit when I just don't believe anything you say. I said, well, then I, I guess I don't have to be here. <laughs> and I left. 
Nobody could believe I did that. <laughs> so I had to go to Sakon to, to explain my unruly behavior. <laughs> well, you were right. <laughs> if they didn't know why you were there, why were you there? Uh, well, how long were you over in Vietnam, Bob? I actually, it does not show, my DD-214 shows 11 months and so many days, but I actually was there about three weeks, three and a half weeks longer because the guy that replaced me, I had money to pay my intelligence net. So you're paying some of the civilians? Yeah, for their information. Are you paying them in Vietnamese money or American money? Oh, Viet oh, Vietnamese. I can't even pay them American. But I put a, I put a 25 cent uh, American script in there. You couldn't even give them a 25 cent American script because that was uh, that was you know the American money. The Americans Americans didn't have cash. They didn't have American money. They had American script, and that's what you had to use to pay whatever. Uh, when you go into town or something, go to some American place. Oh, you can't go, you can't pay some Vietnamese with it. You got yeah. a BX or whatever. And was that because they didn't want, they didn't want to be going someplace else using American money because they didn't want them to know that they were friendly no. to Americans? They didn't want them to take the American money someplace else and exchange it for real American money. Okay. Well, let, let's, let me see a couple of your pictures. Um, Oh, here's the, here's the script. There's a script, and what's, what is this? That is the, if you re take, open it up, you'll see that it has my name on it as the detachment commander of OSI detachment 5009, 5009, which is, that's where I was. It's written in uh, Vietnamese. Yeah. Can you read that? Uh, yeah, it says, uh, the, <sighs> Kim Chuk, which is, uh, Kim Chuk, which is, uh, greeting. I am giving you one year of my congratulations for New Year. Okay. On. Here's me with the Koreans. Okay. Now, where where are you in, in this? That's at Fu, That's at my Phuket Air Base. That's a that's the hooch that where I where I, where I was, and is, that's the same your, thing. Is your good friend there? Uh, uh yeah. No, he's not. He's not in that one. Okay. I don't think. I'm looking at it sideways. There's Grimsley with me. Uh, which one's Grimsley? The guy with the black mustache. Okay. The guy in the middle of what rank Pat was, Hayes. What, what rank was... He was captain as well. See, he was first lieutenant at that time, became captain. Oh, See I? the shirts? Yeah. That's why I had my shirts cut off so that I would have a place to hide my weapons. And Hayes is in the middle? Yeah. What, was, what rank was he? He was a captain. And what rank were you at this time? I was a first lieutenant. And there is the group that's Dick Lewis is on the left. Hang, hang on. Jerry, the... Uh, Jerry, our, our clerk, then Pat Hayes, then Bob Stiskel, and then Frank Costa. Okay, let me just show that. Hopefully they'll see that. Uh, and uh, who are these? That's on Mr. The Lynn. Go from the left. This is the Dick left. Lu Dick Lewis, Jerry, Pat Hayes. This is Nguyen Lin, Nguyen, Nguyen Quinn Lin, and that's Frank Costa. Okay, that's going from right to left. Yeah. Okay. What, was, what rank was Costa? He was a sergeant. 
And, and what was the uh, Vietnamese fellow? That, well, he was my ter interpreter. That's the guy. And here is Dick Lewis and a Vietnamese individual and uh, me. Let me ask you about uh, eating with the Vietnamese. Did you ever eat in any of the Vietnamese homes? Did I ever get what? Did you ever eat in any of the Vietnamese homes? I ate outside of them, yeah, with them, yeah. Outside of the homes with them. Why not inside? Nobody ate inside. That I can recall. Uh, my vaccination certificate. I'm looking for the picture of the Koreans because the one, Pak is there and he is, he looks mad, he looks so typical, like he's mad at the world. Let me see your DD-214. That's, his, that's my other one, my became an officer. Did you uh, get any uh, awards or medals or anything? I Citations? got a bronze star. And what did you get a bronze star for? Why did I get one? Yeah, well, I have no idea. As far as I was concerned, I didn't deserve it. I, there were a lot of people that did. Well, when did you get it? Uh, there's a picture in there somewhere of me getting it. But why did you get it? I mean, was it after some uh, encounter or what? No, when I got back to the States. Okay. Uh, I was at Wright Patterson at that point. Who's giving you the Bronze Star? The Colonel in charge of uh, the uh, OSI district. I don't remember his name. He was very proud of me. Obviously, you must have done a good job. Yeah, I, had a, I have somewhere an officer's efficiency report that tells you how wonderful I am. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you know better. <laughs> Well, let me, uh, I don't know how much time we have on this, on this uh, interview tape, but... Uh, I don't know what happened to, to well, the Korean picture, but... What's your, what's your date of discharge? Uh, May 1st, night there, no. That one is 26... 20 October 66, that's when I became an officer. I was a staff sergeant E5, AF 157 So when did you get out? May 1970. May 1970. So you were in there almost four years. Yep. Uh, where did you leave Vietnam from? <laughs> da Nang, I think. And how did you get to the States? Boat, plane, walk? It was a, uh, that I know was a contract flight. And, and basically, it, coming across the Pacific to Seattle, Tacoma, four o'clock in the, you know, I, I'm just, I guess I'm weird, but anyway, Four o'clock in the morning, I'm looking out the window. I was, since I was an officer, officer I had priority, you understand. <clears throat> anyway, I was, uh, I was sitting at a window seat in the front of the aircraft. Not first class, they, these, these, were like, these were like jungle uh, flights. They, they, there was no first class, there was no separation. It was just a whole flock of uh, seats. Anyway, I see a white something off in the distance. I go, what the hell is that? It's two or two hours out of Seattle, Tacoma. I sit back and sort of relax. Look at, Jesus, what the hell is that? Turns out it was the mountain. Oh. Mount, Mount Hood? No. Mount Helen? No, Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier, okay. 
Two hours out of the United States, I saw that damn thing. I was just amazed. I, you have no idea how, how pleased I was, because I, I think I told you, I took my R&R &R in Hong Kong with my first wife. And I loved Hong Kong, just loved it. I hired a taxi, went all over, went out to the uh, new territories. And, you know, the Chinese communists, everything was so nasty about Chinese communists, this, that, and the other. And I'm looking at it. On our way out, I see these huge pipes, 10 feet or better in diameter. And I'm looking at this damn thing. I finally said to the cab driver, what the hell is that? Well, that's the water for Hong Kong. Anytime they wanted to, they could have just shut off the water, except that that was the, a large part of their... The economy, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It was, but it was like... You know, something I forgot to ask you about. There was, there's an incident, and I don't think we've talked about it today, an incident where you're with a fella and he sees this light. I don't know if we talked about this at your house or in this interview. He sees this thing that's a light and he keeps looking at it oh. and doesn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. One of the first attack on Phuket Air Base was a sapper. Once again, the big long bamboo stuffed with explosives. And they were trying to sneak up to the flight line. They came up a draw. They had cleaned out and they had cut the fence in this draw way down below. And they, <clears throat> about 10 of them, maybe a dozen, they started up this draw and they finally got to a point where they were getting very close to where the American military was located. The, where they were close to was the EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Building, which was alongside of the flight line. Flight line's here, this is, building is here like 150 yards, 150, 100 yards, whatever. <clears throat> and all of the F-100s and F-4s and all the various aircraft were there. Anyway, he, this guy comes out around 10.30, quarter to 11 for a cigarette. And the, v, the no, VC, who is it? He's, he's just coming out for a cigarette to check things, not to check anything out. He's but, just, but who was it? A friend just, of yours? Just, no, he was just a guy that was uh, part of the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Group. <clears throat> anyway, he says, he tells me later, because I had to interview him later for, uh, to send that down to Saigon to tell them what was going on. <clears throat> So here we are, and he's out for a cigarette. He goes out for his cigarette, and he lights up his cigarette, and he's standing there, and he's looking out that's away from the building, and he sees something, and it doesn't it doesn't register what it is. It looks like a light coming at him. What the hell is that? So and he's just looking. And then it's about three seconds, four seconds. This is this is a this thing comes by him and hits the corner of the building and blows up. <laughs> it's literally a rocket propelled grenade. Now a rocket propelled grenade is about so long, and there's a warhead on it about like this, and it's a shaped charge. And the reason I tell say that to you, and the reason that is important is this. A shaped charge does not blow back at you. The shaped charge, the charge goes forward. That's the same type of thing they use to shoot tanks, to blow up tanks and this, that, and the other, because the shaped charge forces, forces the force of the explosion to go forward into a... An object. Into an object and can do as much damage as it can. So anyway... This thing blows up, and now he realizes he has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so he turns around, runs back into the building, which I don't know what the hell good that was going to do him, but that's what he did. Now, everybody's getting excited. 
And now the people on base know that there's there's an, an, an unpleasantness. Some, somebody is yeah, there's an unpleasantness going yeah. on. So so now the sirens start to run, ring, or blow, and now everybody's excited and everybody's running around and everything's going on at one time. And the the MPs are there with the dogs and they're this and they're that. And anyway. <coughs> There's a lot of shooting, a lot, not much getting hit. There's a lot of this, that, and the other going on. And meanwhile, these guys are, are booking for the exit. <laughs> They're very disappointed and very disillusioned because this ain't working. So <laughs> anyway, a couple of the guys that I know who were really good figured out what was going on. So he, they, they set up a little trap at the end, and they, there's a firefight going on. So now the base commander, he wants to give a general issuance of armament to all personnel. This is over. Everything's yeah. done. What's going to happen is going to happen. It's done. Nothing further is going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. And do your buddies uh, get any of the... Uh, oh, yeah, the unfortunate uh, enemy personnel, yeah. Enemy combatants, as we call them. So, anyhow, I once again I'm the bad guy, Colonel. It's over and done with. These guys are headed off base. They're not going to stick around. There's only a few of them, and there's you got you got enough people running around here. You couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting something. <laughs> Why do you always have to be such a pain in my ass? I don't, Colonel, I'm not trying to be a pain in your ass. If you give a general order uh, to issue uh, firearms, there's going to get people shot because nobody knows what the hell they're supposed to do with them. So did he call so it off? So he canceled her. He called her off. <laughs> Well, the other thing was, I told him, I said, you know, I said, you have no idea. I said, some of your MPs decide they want to play fast draw and they shoot each other. So what the hell are you doing now? Yeah, yeah. So, it's a good thing you took your once advice. again, I am, I'm not the fair-haired boy. <laughs> okay, we get you back to, you, you see Mount Rainier, and we get you back to, to Seattle, Tacoma. And are you in uniform? Yeah. And are there any civilians at the airport? Oh yes, very unpleasant ones. And tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I, one of the first, as an officer, I'm one of the first piece people off the off the aircraft. And there were people there. So there had been a prior aircraft that had offloaded, and there were people. There were military people there, and there were still fights going on. Okay, and so I'm I talk I'm ca talking to the man who's in co actual command of the troops. I said, get him out of here. Whatever you got to do, get him out of here. I said, take him someplace, get him out of here. Seattle, Tacoma, this place is this place is going to be an ag is going to be a problem, and your guys are looking for a fight at this point because they see their buddies fighting. So let's get the hell, get everybody out of here. What are you going to do? I'm changing clothes and I'm going to get the hell out of here. And that's exactly what I did. But in the meantime, there were several fights that broke out and there were people running around trying with chicken blood trying to throw it on people and this, that, and the other. It was just an ugly scene. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, I have had experience with media over many, many years. Yeah. And my experience with media, even then, was that it was very unfortunate that they had no, they expressed opinions or they had no understanding. They, they did a hell of a lot of stuff in Vietnam, especially, where they had no knowledge uh -huh. of what was really going on. Yeah. So, did, did you know, you, Jane Fonda is only part of the problem. So, did you get your uh, uh, get your fellows out of there? Yes. 
We got, we got everybody out that we could. I think there were maybe half a dozen left, but there were 250 people on the airplane. Yeah. So there's, um, there's, and the worst part about any of that is as soon as that started, the military was the one that started it. They were the ones that started it? No, they were not. We're not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you mean the war itself? No, I'm talking about the, the, the homecoming. That, the homecoming. Yeah. You know, these guys are these guys are just a bunch of fighters. They want to fight with a whole bunch of people. Well, what what was what was the general feeling uh, when you when you get home? What was your general feeling about why we were over in Vietnam? Or did you even have one then? I believe that. You probably can tell from my history that I was trying to find ways to do my job better. It, it was just a job. You didn't have any political feelings one way or the other about whether... Well, I've always been sort of a conservative individual, but that wasn't the point. The point was that's not what I'm here for. I'm here, I'm here because I have so, such and such training. You had a job to do. And, and I'm not going to just be some schlump. I felt like a complete... fuck off at first because I'm collecting all I'm doing is listening to a Vietnamese guy translate a bunch of shit and try and put pins in a goddamn map See, so and I'm not doing anything not, I, I'm just the do 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 I feel like one of the three stooges for the god's sake <laughs> and, and that's not a good feeling for me I like to get things, I am a person who likes to, to get things done, get some things done and make some things happen. So I kept finding ways and people to, to, to you, make something occur that, and to have a, a, an impact on the people over there to make them realize that not everybody's out to just kill them. Well, you, you felt like you were making an impact on, on, some, on the situation? On some of them, yeah. Some, many of them, oh, I told you, I was called Ong Bo, the bull. My size was, I mean, you can't, you cannot do <coughs> secure surveillance on somebody when you're six <laughs> foot tall and everybody else is five foot even, okay? Yeah. You guys aren't gonna sneak around very well. <laughs> You're, gonna, right. you're, you're pretty uh, pretty apparent to the average human being. Right. I'd even, so, but, I'd even have a worse problem. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was not my point. Was what I was what I what I felt I was trying to do. I felt that that the people that I that I really dealt with for the most part, we had a very good relationship. Good. And we were very, and we were very uh, compatible. And they saw that that there was an American that was that was just just another person. Now, when it came down to the other side of my job, which was the intelligence part, the actual intelligence part, that was a different situation. But they, I never let the two combine, cross each other over. Mm -hmm. Well, being an intelligence officer, I wonder what uh, our Dean uh, Hanson would have thought about you no. being an intelligence officer. Let's not, talk about not much. <laughs> let's talk about you getting back to the states and uh, where did you go from Seattle Tacoma? Where did, where? I went, came back, back, came back to Ohio for a couple of days, and then I went up to Ward Smith Air Force Base. Where's that? And Ward Smith Air Force Base is in Michigan, and my responsibility at that time there was no bridge to the northern, oh, up, to up, the uh, to up across upper peninsula uh -huh. to the Eupers. Yeah. So my responsibility. Uh, 
my responsibility was I was a detachment commander. And as a detachment commander, I had three agents with me. Uh, and we did the same thing, criminal investigation, security, uh, this, that, the other. The two other guys that were two of the three, one of them was a criminal, in, was basically criminal investigation. One of them was a fellow that he basically ran background investigations down around uh, from, actually from Ludington, Michigan, across to Bay City, Saginaw, Flint, down to, down to uh, someplace just a little south. I can't think of it, but anyway. That, Still in that Michigan part. or down and in just Ohio? Just in Michigan. Coldwater, Michigan? Yeah. No, northern, the northern part. Well, cold water's down close to Ohio. No, we didn't. We never made it down towards D Detroit. There was another detachment that was over in uh, Keweenaw. No, where the flowers are grown, Holland, Michigan. There was another one in Detroit. So they handled that part of it. But ours, ours was. There were there were radar installations up there. People don't know this. But the B-52s used to run dry runs against those radar installations. So uh -huh. there was like, they, and they would run low level. I, I was once at uh, Empire Air Force Station, which is just south of Traverse City, uh, on the up western side of uh, Michigan. And once again, you know, I see this B-52 that's it's like, coming at me at head high. That's an impressive sight, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm looking at this thing, I go, what in the hell? Well, they, they did some low-level runs. And then up, up at the, there's a stone, Petoskey. Petoskey had a radar sight. And, I'm, and I, once again, I'm at Petoskey and there was a B-58 Hustler, which is a Delta Wing bomber four jet, and this son of a gun's coming, th coming through at 500 or better, yet about as high as the ceiling it felt, okay? <laughs> I know it was, it was, it was several hundred feet, but when you see something like that coming across the water of Lake Michigan looks at like, speed. Looks like coming at you. <laughs> it was all I could do to not just duck to the ground, you know, just not because of anything other than this. My God. And then, they were like, that. and then they had people doing stupid things just like everybody does. The one guy at, the reason I got called to Empire at that, the one time was because two guys were playing uh, fast draw, and the one shot the other one. I'm like, gee <laughs> <laughs> whiz. Did he live? Oh, yeah. Shot him in the leg. But it was like, my... What's the matter with you guys? Where'd your brain go? Well, how long were you up in Michigan? I threw May 1st, 2000, or 1970. That's when I was discharged. I was sworn in in uh, April two of 70. I was got out of the military May of 70. In fact, <clears throat> My book ends from my military service. In 1966, I was in Vietnamese language school, 60, 68, in Washington. And Martin Luther King was killed. Were you there? I was in Washington. And, and when I was there, they shut down, they came to the, came to the Vietnamese language class and said, Washington is shut down. Mm -hmm. There, is, there are riots, there are, people are burning down Washington. So I had driven, I had a 62 Ford Fairlane. I had, there were four of us, five of us, whatever, stationed, staying at the Quality Courts Motel on Route 50 in Arlington, which is right across from the Marine Corps Memorial. And we were on the 12th floor, 14th floor, whatever, of this apartment, this huge place on TDY status. <clears throat> and that night I watched 
Washington, D.C. getting burned. And I also watched armored personnel carriers drive going into Washington to quell the riots. May 1st, I am discharged from the Air Force. Oh, yeah, May 1st, I'm discharged from the Air Force. May 4th, I went home to my parents' house after I got sworn in at the Ohio, State, Ohio Supreme Court, May 4th. And they were having kept state. So you go from the frying pan to the fire. Bookends. Um, did you have any trouble getting out of uh, Alexandria? Out of Arlington, you mean? Arlington, yeah. I stayed Had the there. riots pretty well no, quieted was, down? No, they were, not, they were not tamped down until Sunday or Monday. I w we went back to class on Monday and uh, they sent us home. But, you know. We, <laughs> so what did you do after you got, uh, you get sworn in at Supreme Court May 4? Yeah. Okay, May 4. 1970? Yep. And are you married at that time? Yes, I was. When did you get married? I got married the first time in 65. Okay. And we got divorced in 70. She couldn't stand that I had been in, in Vietnam. Yeah, um, did you have trouble emotionally when you got back? She would call me the steely-eyed killer. She did? Oh, she, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> so. No, I would get angry because she was, she would just, she just quit on me. Yeah. She wouldn't do anything. And so I was, I got to a certain point, I would get angry. Yeah. At which point she'd call me the steel I'd kill her so I wouldn't do anything. Yeah. But I wouldn't, I mean, I'd never, I was never violent. But you didn't merit that for sure. What, uh. What did you do professionally after you got sworn in? Practice law. With now, who? They, I tried <coughs> insurance defense cases. I started trying them. How long did you do that? Ten years. Any any particular company or? No, we had. I was in with Bernie Wilkes, and Bernie Wilkes had about every company you can. All the really oddball companies: Personal Service, uh, Progressive, Allstate. I can't remember some of the uh, uh, Cincinnati, uh, USF and G. I tried cases for all of them. So, did you try a lot of jury trials oh, first yeah. ten years? Yeah, they, that was a. I didn't start off, of course, just like everybody. I didn't start off trying good, big, good cases. Yeah. I started trying off the, and so. No, I started trying cases of liability, but where there was such a small damages, a small amount that uh, it, so long as you lost it for less than the uh, that, than what they estimated, you were the fair-haired boy. Whenever you lost it for more, you were a no good son of a bitch. So uh, how did you feel, trying cases during those first 10 years, how did you feel Ohio Northern had prepared, your education at Ohio Northern Law School had helped you prepare for that? <laughs> I thought Ohio Northern was one of the best places in the world. I thought that they, they were very practical, very realistic. I thought <clears throat> I thought that uh, Bayless was fabulous. I Al, thought that, Al Bayless. Yeah, Al Bayless. I thought that George Vaughn was a pain in the butt. I thought that Dan Guy was as smooth as they possibly could be. I thought that uh, the dean. Dean Hanson taught us torts Dean Hansen and was evidence, funny. as I remember. Yeah, he was one of the most professional people I ever met, and also one of the most psychic, prescient, whatever you want to say. He, could, he recognized things in people that nobody else did. Huh. I never thought about that. I, I can remember when you and I first met, uh, the dean and his wife had a party at their house, and he could name every one of the incoming students without having to look at a piece of paper. He, he had, <coughs> he, 
he had an amazing ability to see things in people. So you do this for 10 years, then what do you do? Say that again? You do that for 10 years, and then what do you do? Then, then his son was graduating from the University of Toledo Law School. I had developed a clientele. Many of them were business people because of my parents, because of my father. I, I told you at one point that I had an environmental case that went on for almost 10 years. Um, the, my, I have always had trouble with the lawyers that couldn't get things done because they, didn't, they were afraid. They were, and Bernie told me at one time, he said, they're afraid they're not going to get anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, seems, it sure seems that way. Like they have no confidence in their self-confidence no confidence in their capability to understand what humanity people mm -hmm. so are, me, you, are you still practicing oh hell yes <laughs> by yourself oh yes i i tried the other I, I felt like i think i told you long ago that i felt like it was the halfway house <laughs> the only thing that was missing was drugs <laughs> where, where's your uh, where's your office where you practice out of I practice out of Austintown, Ohio, on a plaza that I own. All right. Is there anything else you, you would like to tell us about your experience in, uh, in life or in Vietnam? I believe, I believed at the time, and I still believe, and I still resent how we left Vietnam. I believe it was a shitty way to do it. I believe that it, the people who did that, who, that, uh, and I, with all due respect, Nixon and all the rest of them, in 1974 when they pulled the plug on those people, I know there were Americans that were, that were hidden away in various little places they were doing various things and were assigned to do various things that were still there. And when they pulled the plug on that and shut down Saigon, I have never forgiven them because it's my view that they are, they're, that the, pardon me for this, that Democratic Congress at the time was, or is nothing but a bunch of thieves and murderers. That's just how I feel. As far as my personal <clears throat> when, did, when did you and Mary Rose get married? 1982. And she, she, is, she is the best thing that ever happened to me, by the way, by far. And has she worked outside the home? She works in my office. She does. So yes. We see each other every day. Yes. You still speak to each other kindly? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> I t as I, when I tell people that uh, that as far as I'm concerned, she is she is the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean that with the most with the greatest sincerity Good. because I, of what I went through before. Before, yeah. And I I refused ever to go through that. I go to explain that. Well, my good friend, thank you for giving us. Pat this Allen. You, let me say this to you. You're the only person I'd ever do this for.